Hello, welcome to a very special episode of Chew the Fat, because today we're going to be talking about one of my favourite films, actually, of all time. I would put this film definitely in my, it would definitely be in my top 100, it would probably be in my top 30, I would go as far to say. Uh, this film, for me, um, was a seminal moment in, in, in cinema. Um, it was as gutsy as it was controversial. And we're going to get into all of that. And we're going to talk about it in detail at length uh, with a very special panel of guests. Uh, just checking in the chat. Uh, nice to see so many people tuning in, leaving some comments already. We've got the uninspired reviewer who's going to be on with me in two Sundays time uh, where we're talking about The Thing, the musical, a very special film uh, coming your way soon. Vex Electronica may or may not be appearing shortly. Uh, Melvin Deeply, good to have you, sir. Thanks very much. Tez made this, who is a man who's very supportive of uh, YouTube channels. Dan Candy, the man who's given me my biggest super chat so far. Thanks very much to have you on. Good to see you. Roman of the Empire. Good to see you, sir. I think this is a favorite film of yours as well. Uh, we have the hairy man himself. Canoli Sasquatch is there. Good to see you guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. If any of my regular viewers are here, please take the YouTube link now and put it somewhere on your social media. Tag a few of us and uh, spread the word that we're doing this because I really would like some big interaction from the chat on this one. So let me bring in my uh, guests of panellists. Uh, first, uh, all the way from uh, the stage production of American History Vex, one woman comedy show, it is <laughs> Vex Electronica. That would be a great name for a stand-up show for you to do, American History <laughs> Vex. It, it would be the tale of how I immigrated to America as well. <laughs> you could, you probably could do a good stand-up tale on immigration, actually. <laughs> right. Yeah, I went through that. I've been through all that. Um, so great to have you back. Uh, it's Vex, always a pleasure. Been? Thank you for having me, Lance. Oh, no, not at all. Um, it was great having you on uh, the other week. Uh, wasn't we, weren't you on my Cocoon stream? Was it Cocoon we were doing? No, I wasn't able to make Cocoon, unfortunately. I, I think I popped in just for one of your weekly roundups. That's all last ah, week. Ah, that was it. Yeah. Taylor Swift Star Wars popping in. Always like to have Taylor Swift on the channel. <laughs> and Ab Menace is here as well. Well, look, great to, great to have you in. Uh, I've got my regular menace from Tuesday night, Stepenzo, who's currently in a submarine. That's why it's all red. Yep. I'm uh, developing uh, photos in, a, in, the, in the room right now. Oh, fantastic. Well, who says men can't multitask? Eh? Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to be getting to each of my guests in, in a second. Next, we have uh, the man who likes writing Westerns. You can find them on Amazon. Check them out under his uh, pen name. Leroy A. Peters. Here he is. Good to see you, sir. I'm honored to be here, Lance. And it's um, not my pen name. It's my real name, Leroy A. Peters. <laughs> well, it's a pen name and your real name. There you go. You shouldn't I have said that. On, You've got to leave some mystique. Pen names. I mean, I'm I trying to build up some mystique people. here for you, man. You're, 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 you're well, I never could understand pen names. Like, why are people so ashamed of, the, of their birth names? Oh, it's not. Sometimes it's not to do with that. It, sometimes it will be to do with the fact that your name is the same name as an existing author. Right. Well, that's true. Yeah. So, and also, you know, sometimes like Fred Smith isn't like very dynamic. So people. Want My last to... name's really hard to say and read, but also like, yeah, Michael Keaton. His last name's Michael Douglas. He had to change. And yeah. Hollywood already had a Michael Douglas. Not I, cool. I did yeah. not know that. Okay. Yeah, last. My name's really hard I, to say. So I understand it. Last but by. No means least, president of the Ethan Supley fan club. Uh, we have Blue Collar hey, Loser I mean, in the house. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. You I, look like a human thumb. Nice. Oh, we're method acting today. So. Oh, he, my God. <laughs> now, Blue joked yeah. with us that he was going to shave his head for this stream, especially. This is my natural haircut we're talking about. If you, if you think that we're we're not committed at the Outcast Creative, you're wrong. I joked about it too, but the thing is I just spent 20 bucks on a nice haircut. If I had still had my long hair, I would have yeah. shaved it too. That would have been funny. I saved, I saved 40 bucks, you know. Yeah. Ben Dad Minister said, what the F? <laughs> yeah, I got it. I think we all did. And I do love Ethan Supley. His, um, his weight loss uh, motivation, it, it should be an inspiration to anybody. That means, um, yeah. Oh my God! An Un uninspired reviewer who I may reveal is a person of color uh, has just said, um, "I'm in awe of Grand Dragon Chris's presence." 
Um, well, the thing now, is, I see a dude like this with a shaved head now. I just assume he's balding, and it's just his way of getting around it. Yeah. You know, I don't. You know. Okay, so look, we're we're taking on a pretty pretty serious, some would say controversial movie. Um, yeah, that's not a word I would use to describe it, but uh, directed by uh, British director Tony K, who. Um, I mean, I don't know if he was from Australia originally. My understanding is that he was British. But um, uh, it's quite funny because I've just watched an interview with one of the cast, um, the actor who plays uh, the uh, convict whom Edward Norton's character Derek befriends. Uh, Joe Tor- is, I Guy uh, Torrey was the name. Guy Torrey. And, and Guy Torrey is talking about Tony Kay and the whole way through he describes him as Australian in the interview, which is quite a common mistake for people to make with our accents in America. Anyway, but uh, Tony Kay is British. So what we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to talk about the film in detail. We're going to work through it in order. Every so often I'm going to uh, take a pause and ask for my guests to see if they've got any reflections or comments to make uh, on the scenes I've just mentioned. Um, and uh, when we get to the end of the of doing that, which will take us quite some, some time, we're going to share our thoughts on the movie as a whole, how relevant we feel it is now, um, and uh, so on. Uh, it's possible one or two other people may be joining us later. We'll play that by ear as and when it happens. Um, now, before we uh, start the breakdown, so just to remind people, this was directed by uh, Tony Kay. Uh, it was not Edward Norton's um, first film by any means. He'd done about three or four movies before this, uh, but it was his first lead role. It was it was really the first time he carried a movie. Um, and um, boy, does he. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, the film had a very troubled production. I don't want to dwell on that now. I, I, what I'm really interested in discussing tonight primarily, we might touch on that at the end, is um, what my guests think of the different aspects of this film, um, how the different scenes impacted them at the time that they watched it, and um, how relevant they feel the film is now. Um, and whether it still stands uh, the test of time. Um, Before I uh, start working through it in order, um, I would just uh, like to say to everybody in chat, uh, as I know it is a controversial film, please keep uh, all the chat nice. I don't want to see any comments with any kind of racial connotations whatsoever. If I do, you will be banned, okay? Um, Secondly, uh, just keep everything polite, but I do want people to con- contribute. I want to hear what you think. Even if you don't like the film, it's perfectly okay for you to say that. Uh, you know, I don't want to censor your comments, but, you know, keep it nice, keep it friendly. And if you if you guys end up having a, a bit of a tete-a-tete in the chat, that's fine. But all in good spirit and keep it friendly, please, because we are the outcasts here. We stick up for one another. And, uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of wrenches in the chat. Vex has got a big wrench, you know what I mean? So, okay. So um, uh, before we work through, I'd like to arch, ask each of my guests working in the Brady Bunch order down this way, so starting with Vex, when and how did you first come to see the film and who was with you at the time? Uh, I first saw this in high school. I think I'd gotten a snippet of it when it was playing on TV and I went and just found it online to watch in full. I watched it on my own though, like most movies I've seen. <laughs> Did you watch it straight through with no interruptions or was this a kind of getting up, answering the phone, going to make coffee? That nope, kind nope, of straight through. Usually when straight. I sit down for a movie, I, it's good. there. I try to eliminate distractions. Good, good, good. Okay, good to hear that. We'll come back to uh, more of your thoughts in a minute. Uh, Stepenzo, how and where for you? Uh, in the early days of DVD, buying DVDs online, especially on buy.com, I just bought like a box full of DVDs. And like I married a strange person and uh, and a bunch of other weird ones. This was one of them. And I had never seen it until I bought it. I knew it was going to be good, though, because I, I heard it was good. And uh, yeah, very good indie film. So you again, you, you saw it after its DVD release. 
when it came out. Right. I didn't see it in theaters or anything, but I remember seeing the trailers for it in theaters thinking like, that looks good. You know? Yeah. Leroy, when did you, when did you first see it, sir? My first memory when I first saw this movie, when I was stationed at Kadena Air Base in Japan, we were doing a 12 hour exercise. I was working on the night shift. So it was a group of us. We we decided to um, watch some movies and that someone chose this movie and it was very interesting because before this i never really had i don't want to say i had a positive opinion of, of, pe- of let's say hate groups we'll call them but after seeing this movie you know i just want to say i think every person who who played this film did a superb performance from Edward Furlong to Avery, from Edward Norton to Avery Brooks. We'll, we'll get into that later. No, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, don't no, get ahead. Just, no, just, stick no, to, just stick no, to where you, where you saw it and how you saw it. Yeah, the second time I did see it, I rented it. I was still stationed in Japan when I rented it. I decided to watch it alone. And basically, that that's, that's how I saw it. I mean, I haven't, to be honest with you, I don't think I've seen it since since okay. I was in the military. No worries. Well, the how I first came to see it was kind of interesting because me and my friend Alan, we, we went to, it was another actor, both jobbing actors at the time, and we, we heard, you know, powerhouse performance in this film. So, of course, all actors are like, well, powerhouse performance, got to go and see that. I didn't know anything about the movie. Um, I kind of love going to see movies when I know nothing. I hadn't seen the trailer. Um and we went to see the film and um, the, the timing wasn't right. And, and Pleasantville was on, uh, which is the, that weird movie where the people that live in the world are black and white. The, the film start, the, the world starts turning into color if people have seen it. And, um, and I said to Alan, well, are you up for seeing two films today? We can see Pleasantville now and we'll see American History X after. And by the way, you know, you really should have seen them the other way around, but. You need a light film after this. Uh, what happened was a load of women uh, were talking all the way through the movie in Pleasantville. So I had to go out and complain because they they were constantly talking twice. So when I came out, not only did I get our tickets refunded, but I got us free tickets to go and see American History X from the cinema manager. Um, so we were very pleased with ourselves because then we got to go and see it for free. Um and it was one of those movies where you t- you could have heard a pin drop the whole way through. No one talked in in the film. No one got up to go to the toilet. Um, it, people were gripped. They were invested from beginning to end. Um, and it stayed with me for a whole load of reasons that we'll come into. So let's get into the film. So um, the original script was actually uh, written by a guy. Uh, called David McKenna, and it had been hanging around in Hollywood for about 10 years uh, when it was given to Tony Kay as his, uh, by New Line Cinema as his first feature film to direct. Um, uh, in addition to that, Edward Norton was um, attached to the lead. Uh, Tony Kay actually tried to get a different actor, uh, and, but he, he admitted, and you can read this in an interview with him, that no one he saw was as good as Norton, and Norton was quite slight built at the time. He didn't have a very big physical presence, but Norton, of course, worked out. So um, the film begins with quite a powerful music score. Now, the music is by a British composer called Anne Dudley. Um, Anne Dudley did the music for uh, films like The Crying Game, The Full Monty, um, and a really good instrumental score for Buster, the film about the great train robbery with uh, Phil Collins in the lead role. She did the music for the robbery sequence, which always stuck in my head. And um, we open on shots of the sea. It's very powerful, and, and the, the music is really in your face. And uh, we begin with a narration, and then which is uh, the narration of the character of Danny, who is the younger brother of Derek. Um, and um, we begin with, uh, and it, uh, we set up that the, the story is going to be in California. Uh, it's kind of in the borderland of sort of Eastern Los Angeles. 
more or less, uh, in the Venice Beach, sort of southern Venice Beach area. Um, and pretty soon we cut to a, uh, a flashback, and all the flashbacks, whether they're one day earlier or a few hours ago, if they're not in the present, they're all in black and white um, in the film. Um, and it's the night of what we'll call the night of the robbery. Derek is who Derek, who's a skinhead. We can see he's got tattoos. This is Ed Norton's character. Is having mad, very passionate, quite loud, animalistic sex uh, with his girlfriend in the house. Uh, his brother um, wake, is woken up by a disturbance outside and alerts him to the fact that there are some people trying to steal his car and somebody's approaching the house. Um, Derek jumps out gets out of bed, gets a gun, uh, goes out of the, the house um, and immediately attacks the people that are attempting to um, basically rob the house. And, uh, yeah, he kills um, at least two of them that we know of at this time. OK, that's a brief summary of the opening five minutes. The two characters I'm talking about, uh, Derek and Danny, are seen here, uh, played by... Ed Furlong and uh, Ed Norton. Uh, that must have been interesting when people were shouting out Ed on set. <laughs> so um, that's the opening of the movie. Uh, going to each of my guests in turn, and I'll get up a couple of relevant stills. Uh, uh, just on that opening alone, up to the end of the robbery, and we don't see all of the robbery yet. We're going to come back and see more of it later. So I don't want you to comment about what happens later. Comments, comments on that opening. Vex uh, first, please. Uh, one of the most powerful openings to any film I've ever seen. Uh, music, the color, the slow-mo. Uh, it draws you in kind of with the uh, uh, bit of degeneracy, right? With the nudity and the sex at the beginning. But yeah, wow, what an insane scene to start off a movie with. Yeah, you're not quite sure if that is sex or not at first because you kind of hear the screaming and it's like, what's going on? Is someone being attacked? And even oh, yeah, anyways. the way that he's like touching her and stuff too, it's it's feels more like he's <laughs> abusing her than you know making love to her. So yeah, yeah, it's a very animalistic, interesting way to to introduce us to your film, but it grips you right yeah. away. Uh, Stepenso, same same section. Yeah, it's definitely weird when you watch this movie with your uh, parents for a scene. <laughs> um, I do love the, uh, yeah, it's almost like a Gettysburg-esque uh, kind of Civil War music they got. Yeah. And all the uh, good, uh, the black and white. That's always a good trademark for like an indie film, you know, a, a lower budget film, especially in the 90s. I think like Pi came out the same year. It's just like black mm -hmm. and white. It looks cool, man. Uh, and yeah, you start you start off with a bang, literally. Two bangs. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> and Edward Norton, dude, looking so jacked. I think he did Primal Fear before this, or around the same time. And he, uh, he did it. Brawny. He did it. He did it before this, right before. Right. This. He's so huge in this movie, and this is before the Marvel uh, steroid uh, diet that everyone's on. He was just naturally like he got real buff. It's crazy. Unrecognizable. Yeah, he, he, he did buff up a bit for the for for the role. Uh, Leroy, comments on the opening? Well. The first time I saw it, I didn't see the opening. It was already gone. But I remember when I first rented it and saw it by myself, the opening, that was the first thing that kind of, it was like your face. I'm like, damn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's the first thing. That, that's, yep. that's, the only, that's the only word that comes to mind. We're like, damn. Yeah. I, did you, did I, you say I, the first time you watched it, you were on tour in a base? Yeah, I was stationed in Japan. We were doing an exercise, a 12-hour exercise, and I was on night shift, and we, I was with a group so of people. What, what, but I hadn't what, seen what the beginning when we were, it was already was on. The, no, 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 but, sure. But what was the reaction from all of your... Um, from you my know, friends? Your, your fellow my soldiers. To the, when, the, when the scene opened and you can hear that sex happening, did everybody well, cotton well, on well, to the fact that it was sex and was, like, jeering well, a bit, or weren't well, they sure what was going on? Well, that's the thing. When I first saw it, I didn't see that sex scene. They were it was they were already watching it. They were already watching the movie. Oh. No one talked about it. Gotcha. Now the oh, second okay. time I saw the movie, I rented it. I was still stationed in Japan. I watched it by myself. And so when I saw that, when I saw the beginning, the entire beginning, 
and I saw that sex scene, the first thing that came to mind is, damn. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think that's how you pleasure a woman, but hey, <laughs> that's all I gotta say. Is, damn. Well, we can we can come back to that in a little bit. Mm. Um, I, I will we, say we, we what, have a bit of a wider context of that scene later. Um, I, will, I will say this, Lance. Um, when they were when the when the gangs gangbangers were trying to break into his car, and Edward Furlong warned his brother. Um, the first thing that I found in, found interesting was to hear a white a white person say, "Is the guy strapped?" Yeah. Yeah, I, you don't hear actually white people, any white person, talk uh, ebonics basically. So <laughs> that that also that was the second thing that kind of stuck out to me like that. So from what I remember, because I haven't seen this movie in twenty years. Like I said, the last time I saw it, I was stationed in Japan. I was in the military, but there's there are a lot of things you don't forget, and that yeah, first, that, that that first that, two that, scenes was something right. that I don't forget. That might be the first time I heard a white character say that in a movie. Actually, now I think about it, that, that might well be that might well be the case. For Fresh myself. lingo. That's why they had to explain what it means to the plebs in the audience. Straight well, huh? yeah, it means gun. Oh. <laughs> so, um, the Crips that are attacking the uh, the property, um, two of them are two of them are taken out, um, and a third is wounded. We find out more about that scene later. We then cut to Danny, the younger brother, Ed Furlong's character, uh, his narrative. Um, he's not in the initial scene. Um, Avery Brooks uh, is his teacher, uh, our man from Deep Space Nine. And one of his other teachers is played by Elliot Gould, uh, my man from Bridge Too Far. Um, now, uh, I'll get a different still up for this. Can I say uh, something else are... about the intro real quick? Yeah, please. Because you got these guys breaking into car, but you've got this guy who's defending his house, but he's got this huge swastika tattoo. So it's like, yeah. okay, that's not cool. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, he's in the right. But then like at the end, when it cuts to him, like running up to the camera with this like devilish, like look in his eyes, it's really setting the tone that something else is going to happen here. And it's just, it's really, mm. it leaves that's you on this. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, um, <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a lot going on straight away. Like in that, angel, in that. like an angel, like choir, like this innocence kind of in the music. Yeah, it's, yeah. All, it's all it's all gone. This is like the moment that that everything falls apart for the family. Really, yeah. It uh, almost it, it, like Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> I mean, it it is the moment that it it falls apart for the family, but it has other consequences as well. Not all of them bad. Mm -hmm. um, some of them worse, uh, but depending on who's shoes you're in but we'll we'll come in to come on to that but yeah anyway it, it, it is you do see the swastika fairly early and that, and it's you're good to raise that point because mm. initially not just that bring, but like you know the girlfriend's got a bunch of nazi tattoos and they've got this huge flag yeah. you know in their room yeah. so it's like well, this weird house <laughs> yeah, yeah it's uh it's not what you'd expect to see in your 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 everyday house um he surrenders to the police when they turn up and i mean there's one thing that you know, if you were gonna use a word to sum up this particular shot, he in his expression, I would say that he's kind of that that is like a white pride thing right there. Uh and uh he's well, proud later in the movie, but he's proud uh, of he's proud of what he's done. Yeah, you yeah. You, you only see the beginning of this at the at, uh, at the beginning of the film, you don't get the full on context of it until... i think what's going on is he's got this look of confidence yeah. like he's okay because he's, he's defending himself but when they start grabbing him and putting the handcuffs on like you see his yeah. face kind of get real serious and like okay maybe i'm maybe i'm mm -hmm. in trouble yeah do, the, do we see him get handcuffed at the beginning no no no, no at the oh, beginning no. it's just, right, just we'll, him like we'll, you know we'll running we'll up come, towards we'll the camera come. yeah let's come back to that yeah i'm watching now in the background lens yeah let's come back to that I'll, i've got it on um dvd to my left as well um all right so then we have um, so we got this scene with the two teachers, and what, what comes out in the conversation is that the, the younger brother has just done. He's been given an assignment to talk about a political figure in history who's had some sort of social commentary. You know, other kids are turning in papers on Che Guevara and this sort of thing. And Ed Furlong's character. Any paper related to the struggle of civil rights was the assignment. Thank you very much. 
Uh, he's decided to do one on, um, on Hitler. Hitler. Mein Kampf. Uh, and I, I mean, Wait, that's actually quite... my mind Kampf, which is yeah, grammatically incorrect, right? My mind Kampf, yeah. Um, Elliot Gold's character is quite upset about this, and uh, he is, um, uh, you know, understandably uh, pissed off. But um, Sweeney, Avery Brooks's character, says, look, you... You asked for it. You you gave the assignment. The kids can do what they want. Um, of course, it's unacceptable, but he's trying not to put all the blame on Ed Furlong's uh, character on Derek. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Danny. Uh, and we'll 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 get to why that is later. We then have um, a scene in the high school gar- um, bathroom. Uh, a gang of uh, young black male kids are basically intimidating. Uh, a white nerd high school pupil. Um, the implication Danny is Masterson. that they were supposed to, he was supposed to help them with their homework and he hasn't quite, he hasn't quite helped them in the correct way. And they're basically beating the shit out of him. And it's pretty, pretty nasty scene. So this sets up the dynamics of the school life. Um, Danny comes into that bathroom. There's a bit of a face off between him and, and the sort of lead um, African-American protagonist of that particular group of kids. Um, They kind of eye each other up, um, but uh, Danny is keen to show that he's not scared, and uh, he kind of berates the the nerd and says, you know, dude, you've got to stick up for yourself um, when this this kind of stuff happens. Um, Now, that's that's an important setup for something that's going to come it's a very important setup that's going to come later in the film uh this is uh christopher masterson um is he called danny masterson now getting beaten up oh that's christopher masterson from uh okay from malcolm in the middle i see yeah wrong actor yeah <laughs> so this danny's the, the brother older brother from yeah, that yeah. Yeah. the one we shall not speak of mm-hmm. this is when he's uh waiting to see the teacher about his uh mm-hmm. paper um yeah, so um, he sees the T. Te- he sees uh, um, uh, Cisco. What's his name in the movie? Um, hey. the, yeah, yeah, he sees him before Sweeney. the bathroom scene and he gets the um, the new assignment. You know, they hold the title of the movie and the basic yeah. premise of the movie. You know, he's got to write a history, a new paper, basically a personal paper by tomorrow. So, this whole it's another one of these great movies that takes place in one day or like 24 hours or so. It's really cool. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. I guess it's kind of in two days, effectively, because there isn't there is a night sequence, and we do go into the next day. So it's it's sort of yeah. 30, 30, 36 hours plus yeah. plus flashbacks. Flashbacks. Um, yeah, this is very important. This this sets up the the teaching assignment sets up the whole thing. He wants him to do a. T- he actually says more. He says, "Why don't you?" I think he advises him, doesn't he? He says, "Why don't you 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 talk to a, uh, do a paper on what happened." And and your family, your brother's incarceration, yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. and how you feel about that, and then that voice of that paper becomes the narration. So Danny, what he's writing in the paper is now set up as the narrative for the whole film, and that works, and it works really well. Mm-hmm. Um, so before we move on to the next scene, which is the um, the FBI scene, um, uh, comments uh, uh, about those two scenes, Vex. Um. So when I, I rewatched this yesterday for the first time since high school, and I was actually um, it was a bit sad, but I was very it was very pleasant to see that despite the overarching themes of this film, you have this black principal who's not mad at a white kid for writing about Mein Kampf, but instead he's like, let's harness this creativity kind of deal. Um, cause these days in education, it's just, you have to pick from this list and you can't think about anything else. You can't be creative with it, right? Everything has to be tailored to fit into certain boxes. So mm. I really appreciated that this film goes the other way. It's just not all kids are, are bad. He just needs the proper guidance. So yeah, yeah he it, sees something, he sees something in the kid and he's not prepared to give, give up on him even though his teacher is just ready to to boot him out of school. So I, I really, really loved that scene. And I think it does just for that reason alone, it sets the foundation phenomenally for the rest of the film. Yeah. I think that's a really good, good point. And um, yeah, uh, it goes against 
the normal stereotypes, which is good. Stepenzo, same same scenes. You've you've added yeah. a couple of great tidbits we, already. Anything else? Well, to yeah, we get a great example of like the type of character Edward Furlong is. You know, he's a little defiant little smart little guy but that's the other thing is like this is la inner city school so i'm sure um sweeney has dealt with way worse kids you know so mm -hmm. there's actual like literal gang bangers in the school you know it's not like you know it's not like saved by the bell where like the average troublemakers like lighting off firecrackers in the bathroom like there's probably some like some troubled youth that he's dealt with over the years and uh also yeah all the stuff with um uh just the assignment in general and how you know if he was a real bad kid, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do the assignment. You know what I mean? So he, yeah. he's, I think he does want to be better and yeah. yeah. Uh, very yeah. good. Um, Leroy. Mm. Mm. Keep it short, Leroy. I will. <laughs> I've already put my sand timer on. <laughs> when I, from what I remember this scene, I didn't admit, I still haven't changed much. I don't think it's realistic because I don't, know too many black teachers or black principals and i could be wrong but who would take the time in trying to help a white kid who's a known part of a known terrorist group which what that's what the skinheads are dude I mean, didn't you see that film with morgan freeman in lean on me he was trying <laughs> to help out white kids who were drug dealers that's a true story well yeah that's a true story but we're talking about white supremacist white 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 terrorist. I mean, that's a well, whole it, different it, animal it, right there. Yeah, but at this point, he's not fully ingratiated. He's and and I, I think that's that's why. But I hear he what you're saying. He was willing to help him. Yeah, he's he, he he's he's because you, if you watch the nuances of Ed Furlong's performance in this, mm -hmm. he plays the dichotomy that Danny's going through really well. He plays those moments of playing up to the nonsense that people want him to engage in. But the rest of the time you can see emotionally, he's not invested. He doesn't really want to go down that road. You can see that you can also see the joining like a skinhead gang is no different from joining the Crips or the bloods or the MS 13. It's gangs. Gangs are bad, but. And I, yeah. and I agree. I agree with you 100%. They're all terrorists. There's no <laughs> if, answer but about that, but it's like, it's just different when you're dealing with minors. Yeah. yeah. If I may. Go ahead, Vex. Oh, th thank you. Um, so the I remember in this scene because I was thinking like, oh, if they're all skinheads, they're not going to listen to a, a black principal, right? But you can see in the entire scene, like this principal even call. He's like, get in here, five, four, three, right? Um, he he can see just by the way that he's choosing that Edward Furlong's choosing to interact that he's not a lost cause completely because he still is respecting him as an elder and as an educator when they sit down to have this conversation. I, I think if the, scene. yeah. So I feel like if the situation, like I get where you're coming from, but it's just because of how unique this character is in this, in this tale, there's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like there's an exception to be made. I think if he yeah. were like full blown, much like his brother, it would be a different story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so uh, let's hear from blue. Back. Thank That's you. it from Blue on this. Oh, uh, just real quick. I mean, this I'm watching the scene again, and the exact words from the principal says that you know he learned this stuff, he can unlearn it. But also, this is back in the early 90s before social media, the internet is what it is today. He says mm -hmm. to Murray, you know, Murray, you invited this. You asked all your students to write a book based on civil <laughs> rights in any book. But the thing is, it's definitely it's a controversial opinion because, well, the thing is, it's kind of censoring free speech. Whether you agree with it or not, you asked him to write a book, he did write a book. And if you're, if you're going to say that, whether you agree with his views or disagree with his views, these are his views and they're controversial. But then again, we should be talking about controversial subjects. I mean, something is, is, you know, the Holocaust is definitely controversial. And if we don't talk about it and discuss all avenues of that, that, uh, you know, viewpoint, then what's the point of it all? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I agree. Good. It's like Lance no, said, uh, or sorry, Vex said like, yeah, the whole, I think one of the big themes of this movie isn't hate, but like, you know, forgiveness and uh learning to uh shed those uh chains of hatred and you know love it's like the main thing of this movie really yeah. and just for the record that's all i also got from this movie as well you know redemption basically and we'll talk about the overall stuff later don't yeah. get into Sorry, that man. now so you're getting ahead man i told you already <laughs> so okay so we're just gonna we're gonna take this one at a time one of the things i got for the movie at this point just to say my thoughts on this was 
I immediately could see by this, this this stage in the film alone, what a great actor Ed Furlong is. I mean, I, yeah, yes. I'd seen him in Terminator 2 and, you know, he was a kid and he was having a lot of fun and he, he, he could have, in that role, been playing an extension of himself because he's kind of playing a teenage kid who likes to play video games and ride on the back of bikes and duck out of school. And that's like 75% of all teenagers. But here, there's real dimension and depth to this character already from just two scenes, three scenes with him. We got the flashback at the beginning. There's a lot going on with Furlong in that scene. Um, and then we've got um, the scene with uh, Sweeney. Uh, and we've also got the scene in the bathroom where he doesn't even have any dialogue. Um, so, it, you know, really, really, really great um, scene. And... Um, yeah. Uh, one other thing I'll say about the um, uh, the the opening with the robbery mm. is that director Tony K came from a background of of music videos. Did a lot mm. of music videos uh, in his day, and that whole the way the, st the, the that whole sequence of that robbery is edited and the cuts to slow motion and then back to real time again has a real fluidity to it it kind of it reminds me slightly of john woo um, not that you know the, this film in any way leans further in that direction but it, it's got that kind of there's something about it that's like a ballet um and then you know you put norton in the middle of that with a swastika uh with the slow motion and his expressions of anger and god it's so visceral and disturbing um and again i think his skills as a music director really lent into that, uh, and that that had um, uh, I think that had a big heavy impact on the opening's uh, ability to stun us, basically. So um, let's move on. So we get into um, the next scene now. If I have a criticism about the film, I'm going to say that it's probably this next scene. Um, we're, we're suddenly in a kind of um, a sort of FBI meeting. Yeah. Where local um, law enforcement. It's local law enforcement. Yeah. Detectives. I wasn't really sure who these guys were. And at, at first LA. I thought, I, th I thought, well, I knew that they were law enforcement, but you know, is this a meeting of several different branches? Is this FBI detectives? Is this a murder investigation? Cause remember the, the, I'm talking about my, my thinking at the time I'm seeing this film for the first time. And, yeah. um, this kind of sets up almost like a potential police investigation that's ongoing. Um, but the movie's not really about that investigation. Um, um, it, this, this scene is there and this scene is there to give us a load of exposition. That's the only reason it's there. Um, in this meeting, we find out um, it sets up the background between um, who Derek is, uh, the Ed Norton character, um, that he was being groomed by um, far-right supremacist Cameron Alexander, who's played by the wonderful Stacey Keach. This is a man who has yeah. a reputation for keeping his hands clean. Um, he's associated to various far-right groups. They're getting more sophisticated. The police have been tracking this guy for a while. They think that, and, and we, we learn that this is the day that Derek is getting out of prison for the... Uh, crime of the defense of his house that we've seen at the beginning um so we know he's coming out of prison today it's established that he's got this background with cameron alexander who we've yet to meet and that bob sweeney who is avery brooks's character also has an ongoing working relationship with the police and that they come to him and they talk to him um whether that sort of relationship between police and teachers still exists i don't know um, people can contribute on that in, in a second. It's a very expositional scene, and we then go into a very expositional video. It does the job, um, and, and we see a, a, a video footage of a news report um, that shows Derek, prior to his skinhead far-right association days, when he's being interviewed by a local newsman, about the death of his father, and we learn that his father was killed trying to fight a fire uh, by a gangster um, 
uh, and there's a little bit more detail about that. Yeah. And Derek suddenly goes into spouting on camera to the newsman, and this was never broadcast, of course, on the news. He starts spouting re rhetoric, very racist rhetoric about immigrants. The N-word is used several times, talking about um, the contribution that people have made to the country and comparing these people to his father's contribution, and his father was just trying to do his job. This is the point in his life, his dad's death, that basically drove him into Cameron's arms. And the police are telling us that, but they're also, it, it's used as a, as a device to inform the cops of the background of, of this guy, okay? Um, so, yeah, uh, there's not a lot more to say about that scene, but we'll go in turn in case anyone wants to comment on it before we move on. Vex, anything to say about that? Um, no, much like you, actually, that's kind of like this entire subplot with, I guess, uh, Lord Toxic had said it was the, uh, it's a gang committee. Um, but the, uh, the setup for it, even just like the play out for it, it doesn't, uh, it feels like an easy way to just kind of connect some of these characters or connect some of these dots. So yeah. it's, it's really the only thing I have, uh, that I find is problematic with the story. That's it. But it's it works fine anyways. It is, like you said, just a straight exposition dump. Um, so yeah. I got no problems with it uh, for that reason. Yeah, we kind of need it, I guess, because it, it um, I mean, yeah, it would be interesting to watch the film um, with someone for the first time, cut that scene out and see if they still understand everything that's going on. Um, I think they probably would, but you wouldn't understand why later avery brooks's character is able to influence certain things and we we understand that because of his relationship with the police maybe so that maybe that's the only thing that would would be yeah uh missing uh stepenzo any any comments on that um well i mean this whole uh you know getting to know edward furlong i do like this whole sweeney uh, getting involved in law enforcement. That's how it was in my school, um, you know, in El Paso, and I'm assuming L.A., also Austin. There's a lot of uh, gang uh, divisions of law enforcement, which I'm, I'm assuming these police are. They, they specialize in, in gangs and organized crime. And, um, yeah, it's just big dossiers of people and, and you know, following everybody and, and making sure nothing's, like, really getting disturbed. But I had a – had a uh, he was the coach, the football coach, scoot over, and, yeah, he was basically a cop, uh, you know, <laughs> So like it was one of those he was one of those teachers that, you know, you had to be like, you know, kind of, you know, tiptoeing around, you know. But but, yeah, you found out like, no, he's literally a police officer and that kind of stuff exists. And also it explains why Sweeney gets so involved, um, you know, in this uh, extracurricular type, uh, why he goes the extra mile. You know, he's, there's something it, it establishes that he's he's involved in these kids lives outside of school. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think that is the most important thing about the scene. Over but yeah, great job with, uh, you know, explaining Edward Furlong and his backstory and him getting to do his uh, a big like a big acting scene, like right in the beginning of the movie. It's good. Yeah, this is the um, moment with the video footage with, the you know, where he, he kind of sprouts into his rhetoric. Uh, uh, Leroy, anything to say about this? Mm. About this scene, I, I really don't have much of an opinion because that's OK. You can say nothing and we can move on. <laughs> Come on, man. Well, like, like I said, we're going through it in a lot of detail. Yeah, the, re the reason why, because piggyback on what Stupenzo was saying, like I went, to, I went to a private school, so we never had gang problems or anything like that. So I can't say on how like, Avery Brooks' character is in being invested with the police and stuff like that, but hey, it is pretty admirable and kind of also looking at pre. Edward Furlong's character, I mean, Edward Norton's character pre-Nazi, it kind of makes sense why he jumped into Stacey Keach's arms, as you said. Yeah. No, that that is, it does, this this video is kind of quite important for that. Yeah. It, it, it is quite important to know the circumstances under which the father died. I'm just going to answer a quick comment in the chat quickly. No. Uh, random, I know you're relatively new to the channel. Um we do predominantly review current stuff, but um, it's kind of 60-40. I'm very interested in talking about favorite films of mine that have influenced me as a writer and a director. Yeah. Um, something else I should mention uh, was I actually wanted to put this film on stage, and I wrote a stage production version of this movie as well. Wow. So, 
Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's rights, there's rights issues with it up the wazoo. So unless Ed Norton becomes a buddy of mine, probably ain't going to happen. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's um, it would it would it would work brilliantly as a play. It really would, because it is a talking heads movie, you know, um, yeah. and you don't need to see the curb scene. Uh, but we'll get into that later. So. Um, so, yeah, it's a random. I do. T we do discuss older movies and if it's an episode of yeah. the chew the fat we talk about them in detail which is yeah. what we're doing today uh uh blue anything to um add i'll just say this scene because right now in the film we're portraying where well, we've seen that possibly edward furlong and edward norton are the main main characters also possibly the bad, bad guys <laughs> And if you're going to have a villain and a protagonist and possibly a character arc later, you need at least some understanding of why are these people the way they are for. I mean, there's a reason that they're they're into this white supremacist group, but they're Nazis or skinheads, whatever. So we need at least some kind of understanding of what's what's going on. Why and this is kind of a build up to understanding why he's so you know why he's so angry for. Yeah. And uh, dude, your opinion here is always welcome, mate. Yeah. Uh, whether you agree with us or not, so that's all. You're all good. You're welcome here. Everyone's welcome. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that, Blue. So uh, after that scene, which is quite heavy on dialogue and um, information, um, there is also there's one one bit that that that, that comes immediately afterwards is Ed Furlong as uh, Danny. Is talking about what Venice Beach used to be like. Um, and he's walking through it. And I've, I've actually lived there myself. I lived in Venice Beach for six weeks. Um, and it was not long after this, it, this film was made. It was, wow. I was there in the early 2000s. Um, and he's talking about how gangs have dominated the basketball courts and so on. And as he's walking through, he stops to look at the courts where there's um, a group of youths playing and he sees the lad who beat up the nerd at school. Um, doesn't say anything to him, but we can see that the older brother, who's uh, one of the cribs, has already earmarked him. He's spotted him and there's discussions between them uh, about what might happen to um, uh, Ed Furlong's character. Um, and th then he says... It wasn't always like this. And we go to a flashback and we're on the court in, in black and white. The, the stills I'm going to show you are going to be in color. Um, and, and straight away, the, the, the black and white thing works really well, but um, because we know straight away we're in a flashback scene. But I happen to also yeah. think it makes the film look really good. Uh, I could have watched the whole film in black and white, but, uh, um, but I, I think one of the things that, Tony was trying to achieve was to show the difference between um, before in the world, um, he only saw the world in black and white. Mm. It was, it was simple yeah. for him. It was like, you know, he was right and everybody else was wrong. He doesn't see the world in color until he gets out of prison. And I really like that. And I think yeah. that was very deliberate on yeah. his part. Oh, yes. Um, so um, this is when we're first introduced to um, Faz Bulk. She likes to be called Faz, Faz Runka Bulk. Um, some people may remember her from Return to Oz. Mm, I remember um, that movie. Yeah, but she's... I was uh, when I was her. She's Derek's girlfriend. We're first introduced to Stacey Keach's character, Cameron, who's sitting on the benches. And there's a football game going on. And, of course, we're first in introduced to Seth. Now, um, as John Candy said in the film Stripes, some of you might have noticed I'm a, I'm a little bit overweight. Um, <laughs> and that's the line from the movie. And Bill Murray said, no. Um, and he's, he's trying to take on these very, very uh, physically robust guys. And then he makes a bet that he can beat them at, at, at uh, basketball, which um, unfortunately he's got no chance whatsoever of winning. So he kind of puts Derek in a bad position and Derek has to step up and now it's on. Yeah. And they decide to play for the right to play at the court and basically says, if we can beat you fair and square in a game, then you guys have to leave this court and never come back. And this, this scene is 
really dramatic and the music is like we're suddenly now we're in a sports movie this scene you know it's a bit like um who's white, who's men. white boys can't jump white white men yeah. can't, white jump. Men can't <laughs> jump yeah i love yeah. that movie uh it's, yeah so and it's you know and i noticed in this scene they never pass seth the ball because his own team knows that he's <laughs> not going to score which yeah. i thought was was quite funny um yeah so uh the battle for the supremacy ultimately ends with them winning but at one point Derek gets smacked in the mouth um yeah. it could have turned into just a big brawl but it doesn't and uh you know they still want to just beat them at the game <laughs> and ultimately they they do uh at one point in the narration um Danny says this is why Derek set up the DOC. Can somebody tell me what that stands for? That's the name of his particular group, isn't it? But I couldn't find it in the movie being, what does it stand for? DOC. Mm. Anyone know? Um, if any, if sure. anyone knows in the chat. The DOC. Let us let us know in the chat. Um, yeah, it definitely sounds like a gang. gang. Hmm. Well, that's the, that's the name of his gang. I just don't know what it stands for. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know what it stands for. So mm -hmm. uh, Seth doesn't score a point um, at all. DOC typically stands for Department of Corrections. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it, but so. but he specifically says that's why Derek set up the DOC. Uh, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely something. It's either a gang or it's the area that we control, <laughs> something like that. It's not Department yeah. of Corrections. I feel like the, uh, it might be something of California yeah. because this is California, right? And they even yeah. talk about in the, the basketball court scene briefly, it's <laughs> mentioned how people had moved up from parts of Southern California and Northern California. No one says it stands for Disciples of Christ. That's literally what it means. So, yeah. Oh. Ah, oh, yeah, that could be it. Yeah. Interesting. Disciples of Christ. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I thought Gordo course, was joking. Michael Sarah would know, wouldn't he? He he would have been out to dinner with Ed Norton and would have chatted about. See, Gordo's kind of always stuff. laying down these awesome puns, so I can't tell if he's being serious. If he's, yeah. I, I don't God. think it stands for the side of the surprise because most of these white no, supremacists don't even believe in God. No, it, no, no it these, does. these guys it specifically does. say like very white Protestant, you know. No, it yeah. does. And, they, and that, listen, man, a lot of them try to use the whole Chris. They twist the Christian thing to make yeah. it a whole righteous, you know. Give them power and say we're better than you, and of course that's all complete bullshit. You know, um, see, so like, I'm not sure if you noticed this entire scene when they're winning the basketball game. It's like yeah. the music's almost like it's almost like a Rocky esque, like they're cheering them yeah. on because yeah. it's from his point of view. They, like at this point, from his point of view, these guys are good guys. These guys are winning the fight. They're winning the basketball game. It's like a big victory. They're all cheering and stuff, and the music's like yeah. all upbeat. You know, well, it's, like, wow. it's not like it's like two gangs against each other. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not yeah. like one gang is good. And the other. I mean, they're both gangs. So, I mean, they're yeah. just fighting over territory like they always do. At yeah. least at least they're like doing something civil, like a basketball game instead of just like a brawl or whatever. Yeah. Or shooting so. each other, you know, which yeah. obviously is worse. Um, no, that's that's really good. And, and uh, yeah, we've got to remind ourselves these are two gangs. Yeah. Um you know, the other guys are, are a gang of Crips. And it's the same thing. You can actually see um, the room that I lived in, in this photograph, <laughs> just realized in that, in that white building on the wow. right. Yeah. Just here. That's where I stayed for six weeks. Just there. Wow. wow. So, uh, yeah. Um, but my, uh, room was on, my room was on the side. So I kind of had a side sea view where you sort of had to stretch your neck out the window to see the palm trees. But yeah, yeah, hey man, I was right on the beach. So hmm. um, yeah. random. Good to see you still here, buddy. So um, yeah. Uh, um, in any case, so um, uh, it's a very, very dramatic scene. It's very stylized. I'm going in the other order. Uh, Blue, yeah. did you want to say anything else about it? Oh uh, no, that's that's all I'm thinking about. It's just saying, it was, like they always said, history is uh, written by the winners. Yeah, um, yeah, it is, and it's told in that perspective. Very important. Yeah. Uh, if this same scene was told from the point <clears throat> point of view of the um, black kids when they'd gone home and yeah. it was recreated, you know, it would be completely different. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, good point. Uh, Leroy, anything to add about this scene? Mm -mm. I mean, I remember the scene perfectly, even though it was over 20 years ago. I will say Seth can't. You're right. I remember Seth not <laughs> scoring a shot. He's. Ethan Supley's character 
can't seem to shut his keep his mouth shut. That's how he no, yeah, we get we learn a lot about Seth from this. This yeah. scene. Can't keep his, can't mouth, keep shut. his mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, can't keep his mouth shut. Lands Derek in trouble. Um, is the best friend that you definitely do not want to have. Uh Bingo. Stepenso, anything else to add? Um, I just uh one criticism, it's not a it's not a big criticism, but it's like uh Edward Furlong's uh narration starts right here. Which, you know, it's a little early. It would have been better if he started with the paper, you know. I mean, I assume I'm assuming all of his voiceover narration that we hear here is going in his paper. But uh I just like the uh the paper being used as a uh as a uh um narration device, you know, kind of like about Schmidt or something. Because voiceover mm-hmm. narration is typically regarded as a as a lazy um, you know, uh exposition device, but unless it's done cleverly, like in Goodfellas or this or uh, about Schmidt. But um, yeah, yeah just great how like you know you go to the basketball pool court, Venice, talking about how Venice is nowadays and how it used to not always be so bad, and flashbacks to when you know we would have yeah. these uh, yeah civil friendly rivalries. There's kind of like this respect between the gangs, you know, they're not like yeah gung ho at each other. A level of it. Um, to say R R T and Z, thanks, man. Great film choice, Lance. Very threat tense and tragic. Two words, definitely. Uh, definitely Furlong's best performance. I would agree. Respect, uh, respect Chris's commitment in shaving his head. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, I mean, dude, I can't wait till we uh, do, do a review of Deep Throat. And see what's going to happen. So, um, <laughs> American history vex. Um, any comments on this scene? No, no. Uh, again, does a good job of just uh, setting it up and everything. The tensions, especially like uh, because I think a lot of people forget that this is not a movie just focused on uh, white supremacy. There is yeah. a lot of uh, there's a lot of black supremacy or black racism as well. Right. <clears throat> so it does go both ways. It's just easier to tell the narrative from the white supremacist uh, angle just because I imagine that's more well documented. So it's easier to craft a narrative out of that. But um. No, no, a uh, great scene. I got no issues with it. Um, yeah, good. And uh, toxic. Stop being rude to my guests in chat, buddy. Okay, <laughs> it's always causing problems, man. Right. <laughs> okay. So uh, moving on. Uh, let me press play on the uh, video again because I paused it. So again, we're we're kind of back into the narration. There's a very interesting little flashback here where um, Danny speaks about. Derek getting released earlier already in that day. And he'd already met them. And we see that even though that's a few hours earlier of the day that we're in, did you notice that is also in black and white because it's a flashback. And then we finally come to the present and the present is Derek arriving at their, I'll loosely call it a condo. Um, it's kind of almost like a, I thought it was almost like a motel, but it's like in a, a little uh, apartment block with really quite horrible housing conditions. And uh, the first thing that Derek notices, and of course Derek has a full head of hair now, he's got out of prison, is that Danny has a DOC uh, tattoo on his arm with a cross. So it kind of reinforces the Disciples of Christ thing. And we can tell straight away he's not happy. He's not happy that his brother's got that tattoo. There's a bit of a conversation with the mother and the sister, and the sister has a young Kid, did people recognize what television show the younger sister had been a major star in? Mm-mm. I recognize the mother, though. Uh, the mother is Beverly D'Angelo, of course, from the National Lampoon's Vacation series. The younger sister is Jennifer Lien. She was in Star Trek Voyager. All right. Um, she had, you know, yeah. quite a uh, That's she's right. had quite, quite a troubled time. Two um, Star Trek alumni in this movie. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, there are indeed. Uh, and here she, I'll just grab a still of her quickly. She's fantastic in this. I mean, she's really, really good. Everybody is on their A game in this movie. It's one of Beverly D'Angelo's best performances as well. Um, you know, it's, there's other people that should have got best supporting actor here. Unfortunately, they don't. But, you know, that's yeah. Jennifer, that's Jennifer Leanne. So, um, yeah, okay. Uh, Toxic, you don't need to go, man. Honestly, chat. I'll <laughs> take like a joke, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So we get into we get into a bit of Derek's life. He's trying to sort some things out. He goes into his 
uh, brother's room. And uh, there's a shot of the room here. This is actually taken from a different point in the movie, but I'll, I'll, I'll show it now. And, you know, this is not your typical kid's room. Uh, we've got various kind of SS, Nazi paraphernalia, pictures, posters, photos, you know, your good old buddy Hitler's on the wall and so on. Um, and on his days off, he likes to, like, paint eagles gold, I imagine. So, um, yeah, we know that this is a, a, a troubled kid, but we know that Derek has come out of prison a changed man. We're not quite sure why yet, but something's happened. Can um, I say something? <clears throat> briefly. What parent lets their child decorate the room like that? Well, I think we, we we get to see how much control the mother has over her sons later. Yeah. But yeah, I hear you. I hear you. But I, I, I think we can see, we, we understand why when we see later. Um, so, um, yeah, he didn't, he deliberately didn't really, uh, they meet at the prison gates and then, he doesn't see him again until after school. Okay. That that's kind of important later. Um, Derek actually is on the phone with someone. And at first we think he might be on the phone with Cameron. Uh, it's quite nice. The way that full setup is there. Uh, in the meantime, um, his big buddy, Seth turns up. Um, Seth has three lines, mainly about the fact that he's hungry. And at one point, Seth really wants to uh, talk to, um, Danny really wants to talk to Derek on his own or vice versa. So Seth is forced out the room. Seth sits down. He grabs a bowl of jelly babies. And instead of scooping up a few, he just tips the whole bowl into his mouth. Um, yeah. So, you know, and he's supposed to be on a diet, we learn later. Um, yeah. He's, and, and he's also got a Trident Pest Control logo on his back. I, I would not let this man into my house if he was coming to get rid of my pests. Um, so there's a number of things that are established here, like where the family are at now. Their situation is pretty bad. Yeah. Um, th there's a conversation about Danny trying to write the paper. Derek is telling Danny to stay away from Cameron. This is important. And, uh, you know, we can tell that, um, he, he says he's done with that life. Um, and, and, uh, Danny doesn't understand why, and he gets pissed off and he leaves and he slams the door. Um, we also get a brief moment where Seth is deliberately filming the, un the underwear of, uh, Danny's sister when she's in a chair, he's constantly filming everything. This is like the beginnings of social media, funnily enough, because that guy is always filming stuff yeah. in all of the scenes to document it all, um, for their cause. Um, plus he has aspirations to do a Nazi musical, which we find about later so these scenes are quite simple but there's loads of information um yeah in 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 the few exchanges that we see here um we get a fair bit more about ethan supley's um character as seth um and uh, uh the dynamics between them there's uh, more information on um danny and how danny's being um Groomed. We can see how Danny's being groomed here because yeah. uh, there's, 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 there's this exchange scene while Derek is on the phone. Um, Danny and Seth sit down. Seth is uh, filming him and he's saying, right, I want you to, to, you know, spill back your rhetoric that you've learned from Nazi class. And he's basically saying, you know, say it again, but with more conviction. Tell me what you think about immigrants and all this. So he's grooming Danny to be a racist, but you can see that his Danny's heart is not in it in this scene. He's just kind of going along with it. But if Derek hadn't come out of prison in two years time with somebody hammering this into you every day, yeah. pretty soon it will become what you believe. So yeah. that, that takes us up to the point with the end of the sequence with that video exchange. Hmm. Uh, I'll just see if I can get a relevant still up again. Um, let's just go around again. Any any comments about this, Vex? She's having a wee wee, so we'll go to Stepenzo. Nice, to have your back, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, um, as far as like the paraphernalia and uh, the flags and stuff, I mean, that's really the first time we really see the room is like, yeah, uh, Edward Norton taking this mysterious phone call, and it's quickly revealed that it's Sweeney. So, like, the idea that he's you know in contact with him. Um, is strange to the brother and um, Ethan Supley and 
We've also got that scene where, um, you know, uh, before that, I mean, I love how like there is a flashback of earlier that day when er uh, Edward Orton gets out of prison and that's also in black and white. And it's just, um, it's kind of like just connecting all the timelines together, you know, um, and you don't really realize it at the, at the time of first viewing, but, um, yeah, it's also just like a really uh, tiny apartment. It's not uh, very clean. It's pretty crowded. Uh, yeah. It's just not good. And, and so it's something Edward Norton keeps talking about. Oh, he's not happy with the living situation. Yeah. Um, and the mother has, gotta, there's a lot of work to be done. Ill. The mother's ill as well, isn't she? She's got some kind yeah. of chest infection or something. She's like, no, she's, yeah, it seems like she's got lung cancer or something. I think she's, she's got like, cancer. Yeah. Yeah. She's like coughing up blood or something. Uh, they don't really show a close up, but it's pretty obvious so that that's that happening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like the whole point is like he just got out of prison and there's so much that needs to be done and it's only day one and it's just like, it's overwhelming. Yeah. But he's still trying to maintain a good, uh, be the big brother and smile and be in good spirits, you know, and be positive. Uh, Vex, um, uh, we, we jumped ahead while you were on your wee break. Uh, to... <laughs> yeah, so just about, about, about this, uh, section. Yeah, no, uh, on just on, on Ethan Suppley's character, uh, there's, like you said, there's, it feels like a simple scene, but there's a lot said here. And, yeah. uh, one of the things is just like the, uh, the levels of ignorance kind of deal. So like with, um, with Derek and his family, you kind of learn that it's through a lot of, a lot of grooming, a lot of priming. Um, but with Derek, with, uh, with Ethan, Supp oh, sorry, Seth, there we go. He's just like, it's not even just the uh, the racial rhetoric that he's very ignorant of. It's even just like common courtesy in someone mm -hmm. else's house. So when he takes the exactly. jelly beans to eat them, he starts blowing them out of his mouth and spinning up and then filming the underage daughter like between her legs and all yeah. of this stuff. Creepy. Right. Even just being ignorant to how uh, uh, Danny is is feeling in the in the moment kind of deal right so i i quite like that and you see even that ignorance come through in the basketball scene too yeah. like he's ready to put up all of these like oh just give me the money like i can do it and then he con contributes nothing right he's almost all talk so i yeah. i quite like that because it, it shows it again it adds a lot of depth to this film that at face value most people won't pick up on because there is such a strong story going on with with derek and how he came to be the way he is yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of lot of lot of extra information, Leroy. Well, I remember from this scene, and I really hate Seth. I just want to say that right now. Yeah, I I, I didn't like him much either. I mean, when you're watching the <laughs> well, film, you well, kind of like he's very unlikable. But what I remember from this scene is the fact that when Seth tr knocked on the door, and Danny and Derek's sister opened it, she tried to, and rightfully so, slam the door <laughs> on him. But he basically force himself inside the house um it's the fact that they didn't kick him out or try to force him out is mind-boggling but maybe the it, again it's just a movie because in reality most people probably would have put a gun to his head forced him out so well even the brother uh, edward orton says you know, what is he doing here he's like he's always here it's like he just hangs out here yeah, like, yeah, that, that 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 that's what I, I guess that's the only criticism I have because common sense says if you don't want someone in your house, don't don't let them in your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's also Ethan probably misses his friend Edward Norton, and like his uh, sister says, is like you don't even realize he hates you. You know, like he doesn't yeah. really like yeah. you. But also, we get a kid an idea that he's kind of an unsavory character in the basketball scene. That's kind of the first time like, he's just starting all kinds of trouble. Right and checks his mouth can't well, cash. That music. That Star Trek. Lance. <laughs> Best ringtone yeah. ever. But yeah, I mean, you've got. <laughs> um, he's also really fat, and uh, he's like oh, no yeah. offense to fat people, but he's like really fat, and like nope. he's singing this incredibly racist song. Um, yeah. Like is in that his an car? actual song, or was he changing yeah, sure. the lyrics as he went? Oh so, no, okay. it's no. The recording of the song he's listening to is like a racist version of the um, yeah, oh, Battle him and the Republic. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's uh he's got it's... like racist tattoos on his hands, you know, and um those mutton chops. <laughs> and uh he's an exterminator, so he just sprays yeah, that's what, that's what Edward Norton says at one point. Like, don't listen to him, yeah. you know, he inhales bug spray fumes all day, you know. Yeah, really. <laughs> Who in the right mind would hire someone like that? I mean, if well, has, another white money. supremacist, maybe that's might right. be a business, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's busting out of that T-shirt 
uh, or show. Yeah, that, that is tight. Are you guys familiar with what um, Ethan looks like now? Oh yeah, yes. oh, yeah. I've seen him lately. Yeah. He he oh. looks real good. And I, did he have gastric bypass surgery? Then he no. started. Yeah. He didn't. Yeah, I think so. I think he did. Yeah. Then um, afterwards, he oh. start working out. He just hmm. he's like jacked, man. Completely yeah. Well, let, let's uh, let's have a quick look because um, I've got to give him credit. Um, to see, uh, you know, it can be done if you want to. Uh, this is um kind of video that he's got on um compilation yeah. of his John very Hughes, that, was, that was a good movie yeah yeah it was that was a good movie my name is no, he's a very he's a very good actor he's a very good actor remember the time um, yeah. yeah look at him now yeah yeah he he's a gym rat yeah, yeah basically gym yeah, bro he's, he's, is the term and he's done he's <laughs> done a whole um podcast about his yeah. health and uh you know this kind of thing so yeah credit to him man yeah, Eleven percent the... body fat. That's what he's now, at right now. Now he yeah. can do all those um, action yeah. special forces guys. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, you know who are always like jacked up with beards and stuff. <laughs> uh, he can he can go for those roles now. So, I'll yeah. tell you one thing: if he doesn't he's have a wife or girlfriend before, he he's got. Oh, he's, he's, be getting one he's, um, he's a, he has a wife and uh, kids, to my knowledge. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Leroy. He's not not single. Sorry, man. Um, <laughs> I have to tell us, man. <laughs> Lou, any uh, any comments uh, on uh, that section? Yeah, I mean, everyone, I can't add much except like Ali Vex said, the guy's very rude. He just acts like he owns his house. You're a guest here. You can tell very quickly that, you know, uh, they don't want him here, but he's just, he's so used to being the past few years. You know, if, remember, this is a common trope of prison. You know, he's coming back from prison after three years. And Drink. for these people, brought it, prison. For, for these people, well, he went to prison, <laughs> but, you know, for these people, life hasn't changed. For Edward Norton's character, life has changed. And yeah. it's like they're they're still the exact same way they were beforehand, but they don't know yet how much they're expecting him to be be the exact same guy as they knew three years ago. But we don't know what's what's going on since then. And yeah, he's just a scumbag. And but also, like you said, a lot to unpack, Lance, because um, very quickly as he puts his camera down, it goes to the bathroom, pulls out a gun. So at some point, yeah. he's always carrying a gun too, which that's what gang members do. What I forgot blood. about that scene. Yeah. So like like Lance said, a lot to unpack in just a five six minute scene. I think you you actually blew you hit the nail on the head. What this scene tells us is his life, apart from maybe getting a job as a pest control person, has basically is exactly where it was before. It stood still. Yeah. Um, Derek, we don't know why yet, but we can see that Derek has already gone through a massive change. There is a huge contrast in the person we're introduced yeah. to in the first couple of minutes. Yeah. And the person that we're seeing now interact with his brother. And we can see that Seth is trying to really pull Danny into being the friend that, that he had, mm. uh, that he's now lost. Whereas, um, you know, Derek is trying to pull him back the other way and saying, no, man, the, the, I don't want you going down that road. This is all yeah. set up here. It's And it's done really well. We also get... The, the kind of family perspective a bit more. I'll just I'll bring this up yeah. quickly. I'd say it again, Beverly D'Angelo, fantastic in this film. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's Ed uh, Furlong. Uh, and Tara Blanchard playing the, the daughter of his his sister, yeah. Jennifer yeah. Lien's character. So, um, yeah, she's got a couple of little scenes. She must be she must be in her 20s now, that actress, late 20s, I, I, I yeah. would have thought. So, okay, so we'll move on. We move on. The next uh, scene is basically D uh, Danny sitting at his computer um, trying to write the paper, and that's when we see American History X. It's kind of set up as the, the headline of the paper, and uh, he's trying to figure out what to write, and he's sort of thinking back to when things started, and we get uh, a flashback of... Derek recruiting his gang, setting up his first gang, setting up his first gang meeting. There's that bit where analyze and interpret, and he keeps writing that on the screen. And that really reminded me of The Shining. You know, the <laughs> bit in The Shining where the guy is writing out the endless text all the time. Um, it just gave me Shining vibes for a minute. So um, then he writes out the line, people look at me and see my brother, which is really a big th main thread of the film. We cut to flashback. We're in and black. He quickly and white. deletes it too. 
Yeah, yeah, he deletes it. Good, good point. Like his train of thought. So there's a quick conversation in the past. This is probably about um, three and a half years ago, maybe a bit longer. Um, it's before Derek goes to prison. It's it's at least six months, maybe before the night of the robbery. Certainly, a, a little bit of time. Um, and this is really going to be Derek's first big outing as a gang leader. He's got together a load of guys. Um, this big group of very kind of Aryan Brotherhood types all meet up with him. His girlfriend is there. Uh, Danny's there, and uh, it's a big group of skinheads. And you can see some of the some of the skinheads in this group. And not really that committed. There's a couple of guys mm -hmm. smoking weed. There's a couple of people pissing about. If you look carefully, some of the people in this gang are also in the prison later. And I did wonder if they were the same characters, but they're not. It's clearly just um, that they're not supposed to be the same characters. It's just some mm -hmm. of the extras are being reused in some of the prison scene. So um, Danny does this big speech, and the speech centers on... Um, a convenience store where that used to be uh, owned by somebody they know. It's called Archie's, and uh, a lot of them used to work for Mr. Archie, including two of the people here. And now uh, the store was uh, he couldn't Archie couldn't afford the raising raising rates and things, and the store was bought out by a Korean owner. Pretty soon after the Korean owner took over, he fired all the staff that were working there, including two of the guys in Derek's newly formed gang and um uh one of the things that happens in this meeting is he, he chastises one guy for smoking weed uh straight away <laughs> and says this is serious man and then another guy laughs at one of his jokes and he chastises him for laughing at a joke and it, 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 it there's something about that with him it, it really sets him in this kind of mini hitler he's he's, he's really serious um and, and he wants the guys to be as serious as him and this is this is what where you can see his magnetism is and this is why he's useful to cameron's character this yeah. is why cameron wants to control him this is why cameron wants him to do his bidding because he will get more people for cameron that will do his bidding because he has that charisma he has that power he can go into a room he can do a speech and he can control people he has that same magnetism that hitler had in that respect um, that was that was what Hitler was able to do in mm -hmm. in rooms with people before yeah. social media, you know. So um, and this is also before social media. So he gets the gang all fired up, and he says, "Are we going to do anything about it or not?" And they're pretty soon they're putting on masks, grabbing baseball bats and other uh, improvised weapons, and they go and steam the store. And um, now there are several moments in this film where in the cinema I went, oh, my God, or said something out loud or said some sort of expletive. And this sequence coming up is is the first time I did that. So they go running into Archie's ranch market. And the other comment that he made is all the people that work there are now illegal immigrants so that they can pay them. Mm -hmm. Now, that mm -hmm. may or may not be true. Um, uh, we don't really know whether that's true. But uh, everybody that's working at the store uh, is um, uh, of, of a non-white uh, racial persuasion. And uh, the mixed-race lady who's working behind the store, who might not even be Mexican, she could be African-American, we don't really know because we don't get yeah. to hear her speak. She's grabbed, she's pinned down by um, several of the assailants in the gang. At first I thought this was going to be a horrible rape scene, um, but they actually pin her down and they force her to eat like Mexican food, Mexican guacamole. They're pouring it down her throat. And then at one point, they grab this white paste and they put it over her skin and they make a joke about she looks better now she's white. And in black and white, that scene is so effective. It would not mm -hmm. have been that powerful in color. It's quite brilliant the way it's filmed. Um, and again, we have that amazing score by Anne Dudley that is all the way through this narrative and, and it just goes up and up and up emotionally and the, and the scene gets more and more powerful, more and more disturbing and you really at this point, you start hating these guys as the audience you think, my god, you know you, 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 you hate them, I did anyway um, and it, it's just despicable what they do to this woman, they beat up the owner, they assault several uh, other members of staff 
Um, this woman is completely traumatized. You can also see, if you watch, that she wet herself during her assault as well. Um, and you can see that if you if if you if you if you watch closely. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a really really horrible sequence. Um, in my in my view, if this film was made today, that scene would have been tame. It would have been they would have done it a different way. It would not have been as powerful if it had been in the yeah. film at all. Um, I'm glad it's in the film because um, you don't want to minimise um, the way that these people are groomed to think. You don't want to minimise the kind of atrocities that these people will carry out. And some of them would have been worse than this. Um, so um, very, very powerful scene, deeply disturbing. So before we move on to the dinner flashback scene, can't wait to get into that. Um, <laughs> Let's uh, hear what people think about this. So, Vex, um, and I particularly want to hear the impact this scene had on you the first time you watched the movie. Um, I yes, yeah, so I didn't have like I didn't remember this grocery uh, scene, but when I rewatched it, I found myself in absolute horror. Which is, uh, I don't know, it's we live in kind of a nowadays you have all that like kind of like shock and body and gore horror so you think you've seen the worst of it yeah, she's um, right. but it, it it's a very like i noticed too that this the woman cashier had wet herself i was like you never see them go that extra step for terror because in both situations where someone is petrified that's just what happens um so it was like the entire i just my mouth was agape <laughs> this entire scene um particularly even more powerful is at the very end as he's just like guys we got to go we got to go and instead Derek goes back and he takes the one of the cashiers and he decides to just he doesn't rob them he just throws it through a window and it goes to just highlight uh because we saw that scene earlier uh of the the news footage right yeah. it's not so much that he even he, like you can see the same thing in Danny. It's not so much that he believes what he believes, right? With the the supremacy stuff, it's that Cameron saw a kid who was very angry about the loss of his father, and he saw a kid that couldn't get over that. And all you see is just the manifestation of this anger that he never got to process, and said someone just used it for their their own advantage, their own messaging. So. I, I quite like I, I liked that it wasn't sugar glass either. <laughs> it's a real yeah. glass that he breaks uh, in that scene. So I, I thought that was just kind of the the cherry on top of just this this absolute like horror that we see happen it, at the store. It's, it's really important actually that you mention because I think this is this is crucial for the story. This is his first act under Cameron's influence after mm -hmm. his father's death. There we go. Yeah. So you yeah. see it. You definitely see it. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, um, yeah. So uh, very, very important. Stepenso. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the uh, the uh, the uh, attack on the uh, store, it's pretty hardcore. And uh, it's also just like, I don't know. It's one of these things where like watching this as a kid, you're like, you know, in the 90s, you're like, what are these guys complaining about? Now, it's not even really about it. all about like Stepenzo. Your mic is Stepenzo. turning you into a weird Dalek, man. What? Yeah. It's, what? Like, it's, like, it's like you're standing in a canyon and talking through a tunnel and then uh, going in and out. Uh, try, try that again. Is that better? What's happening? I haven't done anything. No. Okay, it's working, it's working now. It's working now. Go, go, weird. go for that again. Uh, well, like I was saying, uh, um, yeah, the whole attack on the uh, the store. It's like when you hear uh. Yeah, when I was watching this movie in the early 90s, you're like, what is this guy complaining about, you know? Like, what are these people really upset about, you know? It seems like it doesn't make sense. But now, re-watching it, like, the other day, I was like, god damn. Like, it's like, he's talking about, like, all the illegals coming across the border, and it's like, you hear this stuff all the time, and it actually is, it actually is a big problem nowadays. Like, much worse than it was in the 90s, you know? And, mm -hmm. and it's like, dude, it'd be so easy to, like, uh, get a gang of kids, especially, like, that's the whole point, is, like, these are kids, troubled kids who get their asses beat by gangs all the time. So it's mm -hmm. easy to just like regular gangs, you know, that's, that's how you, you you rope them in uh, with uh, the the promise of like, you know, hey, we're going to help you. We're going to protect you. Same thing with like even in the Ninja Turtles movies with the Foot Clan. It's like we're just going to give you all the junk food and cigarettes and beer. Yeah, and you gotta do is just run some errands for us. And then next thing you know, you're like doing stuff like, you know, robbing and destroying uh, private uh, property and uh, 
you know, probably going next, next thing you know, you start getting those red laces, start killing people. It's, it's yeah. like a very steady, uh, steady decline into uh, the belly of the beast. But that's mm. the thing is like Edward Norton. He's like, you got this, like uh, this uh, charismatic uh, leader type character, uh, uh, you know, and it's easy to, it's easy for these, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? These disillusioned uh, youths just kind of follow yeah. him blindly. Yeah. And he's very charismatic. That's why Cameron wants him. He's, 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 you know, he's going to be the guy that's going to recruit him an army, basically. And and that's the first, you know, you look at how many people turn up. And if he'd say, okay, we're just going to go in there. We're just going to nick some things and we're going to run out. That's all they would have done. They wouldn't have done anything else because they would have followed his lead, basically. But they followed his lead. He, 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 he took everything to the extreme. They did the same. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's um, it's really interesting how ahead of its time in more ways than one. There's other things I'm going to come up. Yeah, this film was because the immigration thing also in the UK is a massively divisive political hot potato. Yep, here as well, and we we've got the same issue: people coming over on boats all the time, and you know all of the NHS completely broken down to breaking point. Because uh, you know A and E always full, can't get doctor's appointments, all all that kind of thing. Um, so there's all this pushback, and at the same time, you, you, you know, trying to have a conversation with people about it when you, you want to be humane, you want to try and help everyone who needs help, especially if they've come from a war-torn uh, country where kids are getting killed every day. Um, and at the same time, you know, you want to be able to get a doctor's appointment or a dentist's appointment for your kid. It's a really divisive issue. It's it's um, but this is what's great about talking about this film because it provokes discussion, and discussion is good. Yeah, um, that's what I, what I like having it. I can see that that we're having an entertaining time with the discussion in chat, aren't we, guys? Very entertaining. Yeah, keep it polite. Opinions yeah. are welcome. Keep it polite. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's going back and forth with a whole mini movie there. Um, yeah, so uh, Leroy, uh, your comments um, on that sequence. Um, I disagree with you on one thing, that when you said that they wouldn't film a scene like this, they would have been much tamer. I strongly disagree. In fact, I think it would have been, if they filmed that scene today, it would have been 10 times worse. They, well, they, I don't think this film would get made today, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think you'd even no, get I don't, I don't, think I don't, get, I don't know. I think, I think it would, and it would have been more... Because from what I've seen, and I can only go by from watching other shows. I'm not going to watch other shows. We're, we are seeing, I'm, I'm, I've seen scenes in, in other shows that 30 years ago when I was growing up, those scenes wouldn't have never been shown. And, you are that, that's true, for sure. And, and my feelings about our kind of mix, because I believe in boundaries. I understand why some things need to be shown on tv and as a history major as a history buff i believe that some things should be taught well, everything should be taught in school but something that doesn't mean it should be seen on film you no know, boundaries there's a reason for boundaries and not every boundary needs to be torn down so in this scene like if that scene was if this movie was made today and that scene was shown they would have done more than just force food down her mouth, poured milk on her. They would have raped her. They would have peed on her, defecated her. They, and they would have showed that. And to me, to me, that, that if you want to talk about trauma and disturbing, that would have disturbed me just from watching, even though it's just a film. Just, I'm, I'm glad they haven't made a remake of American History X because they would have, it would have been 10 times worse than when this movie came out in 98. Yeah, uh, I agree. This film should never be remade except by, with a stage production by a British director. But um, <laughs> uh, Uninspired Reviewer agrees with you. Um, and that's an interesting comment, mate. And uh, Uninspired, great YouTuber, by the way. Do support him. He's going to be co-hosting the uh, interview with me of The Thing, The Musical, in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, I've got some comments to make about this in a sec. Uh, but Blue, your thoughts before I do, and we'll move on. If I may, after he goes, yeah. Sure. 
Uh, so you said, Lance, I'm at two two mindsets uh, with you and Leroy. Part of me would think that possibly this couldn't be made today because some would debate that race relations with social media are worse now than ever. Mm. And it's funny how, like you're saying, Lance, um, people, this scene, while I'm not defending it, in comparison to like what I've seen on TikTok, Instagram reels, YouTube shorts, Facebook reels, this scene is is Disney level compared to some of the shit I've seen on my phone already. But yeah. people, are, people are scared to show scenes like this. But then with technology and CGI, you can watch a Saw film. You can watch my, my son plays Mortal Kombat, things that when I was a teenager, I never thought I would imagine seeing on television. We are That's very... Right. We're very good at showing like really graphic violence, but then when it comes to like race relations or comedy or even certain words, we can't say that anymore. So I can't say a certain word without being censored, but then I can cut a guy's head off in a video game. Don't really understand it, but um, you yeah, know, it's okay. Um, be be so. Before I let Vex comment, I'll tell you why this film would not be made now. You you have to create a pitch deck. You got to go into a a, a meeting with a producer because someone's got to stump up the money. So if I went to New Line today and this film had not been made and I said, look, I've got a movie. Uh, it's a lead white protagonist. He's a member of a far right race group. Uh, it's a story about him and his brother who's all. And then they'll say, who are the other characters? And I'd say, well, you know, there's uh, there are black characters in it. Yeah. Who are they? Well, they're, they're mostly other gangbangers. But, oh, there's one good black character. He's a teacher. OK, how often is he in it? Is he in like two or three scenes? Well, can he be the main character? Mm. We'll get Morgan Freeman to play him. Can it be? Can the story be told from his point of view? And I'd be like, maybe. And that's when the script would start to change. Uh, this would not be made today, told from Ed Norton's character's point of view. I'll tell you that now, 2,000%. No producer in the current climate that we're in at the moment would make this film now. It would not happen. I can tell you, being in the industry, it would not happen. Um now that doesn't mean that it shouldn't have been made if it hadn't. But and and I do agree with you that if a version of this film was made, sure it would be more violent and gory, and uh, they would push those buttons further. But this film, in its form, not a chance. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Um, you know, if it was a a black team of filmmakers behind it uh, who'd written the story, and it was a black director. And they were, and they, to be unique, they wanted to tell this story from the white supremacist point of view. Maybe the film would get made with a white director and a white writer. Not a chance. So it's not happening. Um, yeah, but we'll we'll see. Vex, your your comment before we move on. Uh, no, you kind of uh, echo a lot of the same sentiments <laughs> I do about this. Be I agree with Leroy as well. If they. <laughs> made it today they would definitely because i kind of fully expected these guys to to rape her because that's really not above the whole race relations thing yeah, um, but yeah, uh but at that point you might as well just start killing people too i mean you know, <laughs> right you know, um like vandalism you know, crimes offer certain penalties versus like what you're yeah doing. i i find that again this is one of those things that maybe a lot of people don't pick up on this film but it's not White supremacy is just kind of the easy way to discuss like in here like inherent hatred and ignorance yeah. in this movie, right? So if it were to be made today, regardless of what color the director or writers or producers may be, it would focus far too much on the race element and forget that hate is something that comes in all of our nature, right? That prejudice yeah. is something that we all hold in in one way or another. So I think that's the the bigger message of the film when you Peel well, let, let, let's let's save that. It's partly my fault, but let's rein that in and let's save <laughs> let's save that for later. Partly my fault. So let's let's move on to this scene, which is going to still open that can of worms. Um, now, this scene is when I was watching this in the cinema. So we, we, to take the story further, this is the scene where we have the character of Elliot Gould, who's a teacher at the school. The reason he's come over for dinner is because the wife, Beverly D'Angelo's character, has invited him. They're all having a nice sit-down meal. And at the beginning, it's, you know, they're having a fairly decent conversation. And then they start getting on to the topic of race. And uh, Ed Norton gets very upset in the scene. I've actually got it on in the in the background right now. Um, but anyway, uh, and then at one point, the mother tries to rein in the conversation and says, look, you know. Yeah. And it, uh, and she says, and they said, no, we're having a discussion. Yeah. And, it, and it carries on. Um, and, and it goes further. 
Oh. And as that as it as it unfolds, not only do we see Derek's hatred for um, anyone who's not white, but then it, and you think the scene's going to end. You think the scene's going to end about three times. You think it, the, the argument's over. Yeah. And then it goes even further, and Derek just lays down the law, and he calls um, he calls uh, Elliot Gould's character a, a dirty kike. Says you're not gonna. Um, uh, you're not going to uh, date my mum. You think that's going to happen? You think I'm going to let your, you know, Kai Kars come in this house? I'm quoting the lines exactly from the uh, the movie. And this is some of the best acting from Elliot Gould I've ever seen. His character doesn't have to say anything. You can see at that moment on his face, it's like, I can't date this woman. There's no way I can date this woman who's got this son. I can't be in this person's life. Yeah. And and he says at the end, I'm sorry, Janine. Um, he says um, the fr his exact phrase is something like, you've lost him. And what, what she means is he's gone for good. He's, he's turned to the dark side, effectively. Um, this scene is when I leaned over to my mate in the cinema and said, this should be on stage. Because, you know, you have so many scenes in plays where people are talking at dinner and then suddenly explodes and it goes 90,000 miles an hour and it it, it it just um explodes that was actually um beverly d'angelo's voice on my television random because i've got the film on behind me <laughs> so um who's the chick behind me yelling the answers that's the scene from the movie dude so um yeah it's a brilliant scene everybody's acting in it is completely on point jennifer lien explodes it's at this point she realizes she hates her brother she she hates him she hates what mm -hmm. he's become you can see <coughs> in this scene ed furlong's character his his acting in this scene is brilliant because he idolizes his brother but you can see he doesn't believe it he doesn't believe in his brother's rhetoric in this scene he is dis he's starting to become disillusioned by what his brother has become in this scene it's really good there's there's no like you know, and there's no anyone's all right or anyone's all wrong, and 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 Derek's uh, rhetoric is is so twisted by what's happening to his dad. But you can you can see his points that he's arguing on certain things in his head have a logic to them. Um, it's a really really well done scene. Everybody's acting their pants off in it. Um, yeah. So uh, Vex uh, comments. Nope, nope. I, I got nothing. Okay, that's good. Uh, and there, at one point, Rod, I forgot to mention, Rodney King is mentioned, which isn't that yeah, old like at big, this time. It's like the big oh. inciting uh, incident for the argument. Because, you know, yeah. like, uh, like a lot of, like, you know, uh, Edward Norton says, you know, it's like he makes some good points, you know, because, like, you know, Rodney King was breaking the law, but it's like the camera. But then the whole point is, like, you, you see that it's not just about like the arguments with Edward Norton. It's, it's really is like the hatred is what's driving him. And yeah. that's why everything goes downhill. Cause it's one thing to have like a, a nuanced opinions about things. Like, like you said, like the hit past is all black and white to these people. Yeah. There should be like some nuance, but because he's driven motivated primarily from hatred, which was in distilled into him from, um, you know, as we find out like his father and his father figures, um, but yeah, I mean, and this also explains why um, Elliot Gould has such a a, a, a a grudge against Edward Norton. Yeah. You know? um, it, 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 I mean, and also this is what's crazy is like I didn't really put this together until um, more recent watch throughs is this is the night of the carjacking. Mm. This is the day like this happens late. That carjacking happens later that night, which is crazy. So this whole day was like, yeah. you know, a real, real, real busy. Like, yeah, powder keg. Yeah. yeah. I, did you know what? Funny, when I watched the film for the first time, I didn't put that together either. That that only twigged on me. Which makes like the loud, it. violent sex in the mother's house like that much more like offensive, you know? Yeah. You have to assume the mom hears that stuff. It's like Edward yeah. Martin basically posturing like this is my house now. You know, I'm the father. You know, it's weird. It's twisted. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, uh, Leroy, thoughts? I think she kicked him out before well, she tries to, but he, yeah, you know, and I think he's uh, he says, like, we're gonna be leaving tomorrow, I think is what he says. Yeah, well, my, my thing, I don't want to <laughs> put the difference between black families and white families, but I can only 
from speaking from my experience that if I talk to my mother the way he talked to his mother like that, every male member of my from both sides of my family would have torn right. me to pieces. But you have male members in your family. Like right now, he is the male, and it's like there's a certain point He's where alpha, like, yeah, yeah, you realize like you you know the mother and the father too. Like they were there's a point where you realize like my kids could overpower me if they wanted to. You know, it happens eventually. You know, but obviously, hopefully, most most families don't go through this moment where you know there's some kind of physical conflict between kids and parents. But well, you know, God forbid I don't know. it happens. I, I remember. I remember when I went to school in Texas, just before I joined the military, I, I saw girls as young as 15 calling their mothers the B word. And I'm like, all right, what the hell? Who, who, yeah. who disrespects their mom like that? Who gave birth to you? And, and I'm not saying I was a, the proper child or anything like that. Cause I was, a have I'm the first to admit, I was a hellraiser to my mom growing up. And that that's the one that's the reason why I left home. But to the extreme that this man talks to his mother, most right. in most families in America today, he would not have made it out alive. End of story. There's yeah. an old saying, I brought you into this world, I could take you out. Oh yeah. My dad said that to me once. And only once. <laughs> well, I take He's under one. the patio now. Uh, I mean, I mean that. No, oh, no, I'm saying I never, I never misbehave after that. You know. Oh, okay. all right, okay. And, you know, and we, we have to remember this is just a movie. This isn't. I know sometimes movies are based on reality. If this was reality, uh, let, let's be honest. If this was reality, I don't think Derek, played by Edward Norton, would have made it out alive. Nah, people commit matricide all the time, dude. Uh, I have a friend from high school who killed his own mother, cut her head off. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing is like when you this guy's not what? still a friend of yours, is he? Okay. No, he was an acquaintance. It was one of those things where it's like the everyone in the high school page was like, Oh my god, you remember this guy? He he said, Look at this news link. Everyone was like, Whoa. Dear God. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's just right. the point. Is like I... Beverly D'Angelo is a tiny woman, you know. So in a yeah. in a when there's rules, yes, you know, the parent says all, but there's a point where, like, if someone's pushed hard enough, like, you know, like I refer along, he's just, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. And I think it's also, like he says, he hates these, he hates Jewish people. So, like, the fact mm -hmm. that Barry Angelo brings a Jewish man into the house, that that is, like, that's obviously, like, what's underneath the the, the discussion the whole time. That's, like, the thing that's kind of, like, bubbling up to the surface. You know, that's really the main problem he has. It uh, depends on uh, you're right, because a year ago, I just found out a former classmate of mine is now in prison for murdering her mother. Right, oh, it happens. Oh, That's why, like, domestics are so... Uh, living with someone is very, very... Dis, uh, you know, it, it's it's dangerous, because, like, well, tempers let flare. Re let me refocus on the film. Uh, Sorry, man. It's all right. We're, I'm just conscious of the time, and we got yeah. a ways to go. Yeah. So, it, well, one other thing I forgot to mention is Derek grabs meat off the table, mm. shoves it in his sister's mm. mouth as a way to, to oh. try and shut her up. He also deliberately shows his swastika to Elliot Gould's character and says, you know what this means? It means not welcome. Um, and then yeah. I like the pushback as well because um, Danny tries to stop Derek from assaulting his sister. Yeah, he does. Mother steps in. Not only does she demand that he leaves, but the scene basically ends with her saying, I'm ashamed that you came out of my body. And for a mother to say that to a kid is a you yeah. know, pretty... Um, yeah damning scene and yeah i've got that i've made it in my notes fight was the day of the the robbery um yeah, boy so um yeah so you know it, it it is an absolutely grueling scene um the sort of thing that actors love though um because, heartbreaking yeah. how i would describe it though yeah that's beyond yeah. heartbreaking uh zach's good to see you uh in the chat man um, yeah, yeah, Lance. Uh, this entire dialogue gets off from Edward Norton's character. It's a very one-sided conversation. He doesn't want to hear anyone else's opinions. He's right. You're all wrong. And he has a lot of, uh, you know, special words to say to Mur Murray's character about his Jewish heritage. We'll say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything else to say about it, Blue? Before we move on? No, I say just this is how this is. Uh, this aren't conversations you have at a dinner table, neither. Yeah. Uh, this was. Uh, I, I love this scene, though. Uh, like oh, yeah. Not in, yeah. Not in a white. Way, no, but I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it's a, I've shown this scene in an acting class before. Fun yeah. fact: Farouza Balk is Jewish. You know, yeah, wow. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I mean, you can see her character. She's like really getting off on her yeah. character gets off mm. on conflict, and and that that's consistent all the way through the film. She has this horrible kind of glaze in her eye when, you know, she looks like she's kind of getting juiced yeah. when when stuff happens. There's yeah. a great shot of um, it's very stylized of Beverly D'Angelo walking back into the house um yeah. alone. She kind of collapses on the sidewalk and. Uh, uh, and and it, it it's very symbolic, um, but it's like the, the, they know the life has changed from that point. You know, it's sad too, Lance. What, like the scene with the mother, mother's love. She's like, you know, uh, uh, he's just a boy, but Murray's like, he's gone. But even like um, the show Narcos with Pablo Escobar, and so the day he died, his, his mother's like, you know, he's my son, he's innocent, and this poor mother's like, I didn't raise my kid to be like this. Yeah, yeah. Sister comes back, tries to attack him with a baseball bat. Uh, he tries to apologize. It's not good enough for her. She, you know, again, Jennifer Lien acting her socks off here. Um, and uh, now we we have voiceover from Danny again, and he keeps talking about how the night that night he wishes he could go back and change it. He keeps wishing he maybe not woken Derek up. He wonders what would have happened. I mean, now that's an interesting dichotomy because it's the way it's set up with the guys coming to the house and don't forget, they come up to the door and everything they're going there, not only to steal his car, but potentially to kill him. These are gangbangers. Um, he's on their radar already. Uh, he's, th these are the guys from the, the basketball court, you know? Yeah. So, um, at this point, um, when we go back to the night of the robbery, uh, now we're going to see, uh, the, the robbery in, in all of its, Glory. Um, glory. And this is, um, uh, or glory, yeah. yeah. This is when we also learn that, that Danny actually, which we didn't see at the beginning, he tried to stop Derek from committing the ultimate act. He mm. actually screams out, Derek, no. no. Um, spoiler alert for those people that um, don't know what happens here. I mean, it, it, it is absolutely awful. Um he forces well, one of the guys that he's wounded to open his uh, mouth Boy. Uh, on the curb, uh, uh, a thing known as curbing, and there's a few other names for it, and basically then uh, stomps his, his head. And uh, when that happened in the cinema, I heard yeah. the whole cinema fucking gasp out loud. You could, you could like, everybody was just... You know, and it, the way that it was done was very clever as well because they cut to a a long shot, so it wasn't um, too yeah, voyeuristic. Edward Furlong's point of view. Yeah, what he's yeah, yeah. across it was the Ed, Ed Furlong's point of view. It was very quick. Uh, the music in this scene is very dramatic, and then it's that's like horror kinda, strings. Yeah, when you kind of then the police turn up and we see him uh, getting arrested. Uh, I'm just there's a still of this I've seen before. I just want to uh, see if I can get it. Um, I just want to say this is the first time I even, when I first saw that scene. This is the first time I even heard of a curb stomp. I never right. heard of a curb stomp once ever until I saw that scene. Oh no, I'd I'd heard of it before, but I'd never seen it in a movie. I uh, can't yeah. say I'm in a rush to see it again in a movie. Now, now we all know if someone tells you to put your mouth on the curb, you say no, <laughs> shoot me. I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you want to kill me? Just you know, put a bullet in my head. The second um, time, the second and last time I saw a curb stomp was on The Sopranos. Right. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That is on The Sopranos. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Um, well, we're doing a Sopranos mega stream next week. Uh, not really, but um, <laughs> we may well do it at some point. You never know. That 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 could happen. That could happen in the future. Um, yeah, this scene is. I remember turning to the. The, the guy I was watching the movie with and I, I said, Christ, I think that's one of the, the most awful things I've ever seen in a film ever. And, um, you know, and it, it, I think somebody walked out. I think if I remember rightly, somebody I walked out the movie at that I can point. See that. Um, I can see uh, that. Yeah. And I mean, you oh. know, yeah. Um, and then after that, you know, police turn up, he kind of surrenders. Um, but and there's I'm, a moment of sort of this weird twisted pleasure on his face. But then yeah. when he actually gets cuffed and, and put over the car, the expression's a little bit different. So Vex, uh, oh, thoughts? Boy. Sorry, Stepenzo, I'll come to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vex, your thoughts? Um, 
Yeah. Audibly gasped at the curb stop scene, even though you don't actually see. Again, it's like because of it's how so we're kind of conditioned. It's very quick. Yeah, yeah, and we're conditioned to kind of see all the gore and stuff, right? But you don't see it, but you know it happens because you see the body afterwards and the head is is uh, is still moving. Yeah. Um, the look on his face, though, I think this was what uh, sold me as an actor because I'd seen uh, like I'd seen Edward Norton in other things, um, but it, I never really felt like he was acting. You know, it kind of felt like he was just playing variations of himself. Um, but the way that his face kind of goes from like this wild, just like animalistic evil. And then briefly, there's a moment where he recognizes what he might have done. Like there's a bit of the old Derek there. And then it just kind of like it, it dissipates into just like this mix of adrenaline and fear is the is the emotion you kind of see across his face. And then he also is recognizing, fuck, my little brother is just over there. And he just witnessed this whole thing. I think Danny's only like 13 or 14 at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, I like, I would rank this probably as one of the most impactful scenes in cinema. Uh, from start to finish, it yeah. is yeah. masterfully crafted, shot. The black and white is perfect. The music is perfect. Um, you don't need the shock value of seeing the actual stomp. It's just like everything that they've laid out for you leading up to this builds the tension enough for for this scene so oh brutal brutal to watch even 26 years later yeah uh it depends on yeah um i think another big thing about this scene specifically it's just like um i don't know you've got um edward furlong is this like this is I, i'm assuming this is the first time he's killed somebody right yeah yeah um, yeah and the fact yeah. that he's like like he's very pleased with himself he's like it's finally happened like it seemed like he was something that he knew was inevitable, you know, and he was very yeah. excited to, it's like most gun owners in Texas, like <laughs> can't wait to finally use this thing on someone breaking in my house, you know, but, but for the most part, I don't know. Yeah. He's got this really uh, sadistic, like pleasure on his face that like Vex said, and it's just quickly the reality sinking in that actually this isn't going to go the way. I don't know. He's probably thinking like, ah, he'll be hailed as a hero who defended his house, you know, but uh, like we see in the, right. um, in the, uh, writing scene after this like he says that yeah it's like they thought he went too far which is why he's in prison like there's defending your house and there's there's doing whatever that is he know? was convicted for voluntary manslaughter according to um danny's yeah. paper which and then the best part at the end is like he would have been life if i had testified yeah yeah um yeah it's it, yeah you're, you're both bang on um leroy any thoughts uh quickly one word evil yeah, I, I would agree. Evil. I would agree. Uh, Blue? Yeah, I'm going to say, you know, listening to it, like Vex would say, oh, I've just had to have my headphones on. What makes it worse is the sound effects. They toned down the music when the poor kid's got his um teeth on the, the, the concrete there. Oh, yeah. you, can actually, you can actually hear the sound effects of his teeth. Like probably, use, probably use veneers or something, obviously. but like, like a crack, isn't that? Yes. And like, yeah. and, and like oh, you said, Lance, earlier, everyone got their turn but we we're busy the first time i saw this movie this scene right here i was in state prison watching this film Whoa. god Jeez. damn man Whoa. and, I, and they, the they allow movie, that for like prison yeah, viewing so, well the funny part so because i i've heard of the film but you know i'm like 25 years old and i'm like hey i'll go out and watch tv with some guys and uh, some guys go into the the dorm there and the tv room i'm looking around i'm like one white dude found by 40 black guys and i'm like oh i'm gonna die tonight like <laughs> what a, what a, what a, now, but that's the whole point of the movie i bet you everyone was like high five at each other afterwards right I like mean, we're all friends right people, well i i like i do through comedy i just you know one guy's like hey do you feel this way i'm like well i did until this moment and i think a bunch of guys oh bust out laughing just i had to break the tension but um yeah, yeah it's a very, yeah. very it's impactful prison. a very impactful scene to see when you're the only white dude in, in jail and like oh boy um yeah <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I mean, that, what is everyone else like reacting to that scene? Because that's like the thud and the silence and then the big music sting. It's like, dude, it hits everyone the same way. It's yeah. like, whoa, uh, there's not there's not many people here uh, that can say <laughs> they saw that film uh, yeah, under that prison, uh, no or, circumstance. Yeah, I saw this one I opened that night, so <laughs> I'm, oh I'm not surprised. Um, we we move on from this uh, after that story has been told. We've got two of Danny's friends turning up. And these are like the future Seths in his life. They're basically two complete wasteoid idiots. There's a brilliant scene with them, which is on the DVD under the deleted scenes, 
which is um, cut from the movie, where they attack a, a sort of old lady, black lady on Venice Beach and tip over her shopping cart. You know, she's like one of those weird shopping cart ladies and make her cry. And I'll tell you what, that, that scene is proper powerful and it's a shame it's not in the film. Um, in fact, there are three deleted scenes that are all really good and I think they all should have been in the film and I would have been quite happy if they'd all been in, but I guess it was a running time issue. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of them. So you would have had, if that scene had been in, you would have had a bit of context to who these two idiots were when they turn up. We're now onto the celebration party that's been arranged to celebrate Derek's release. Derek has specifically been told, um, Derek has specifically told Danny not to go there. He doesn't want him there that night because Derek knows he's going to go to the party and he's going to sever his ties with the Aryan Brotherhood, this organization and everybody that's connected to it. Uh, the two young idiots that go to the party with Danny are trying to impress Seth. We see what a bully Seth is. He just kind of bats them out of the way because they're not important to him. So he's he's not, you know, he's not impressed by these kids wanting to be impressed by him. The party's got a real interesting mixture of strange characters. Um, you've got like one guy who's sort of literally got an Adolf Hitler mustache and is kind of dressed up a bit like him. I remember that mustache scene. is what it's called. Yeah, yeah there's various um, other strange characters. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it's pretty, well, it, it, it's quite funny um, in a way because uh, Seth has got this like Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe denim jacket on with sort of a, like a Luftwaffe Nazi symbol eagle on the back. And um, anyway, so Derek goes to the party, um, confronts Cameron. Um, berates Danny for being there, orders Danny to get out, but kind of does it cleverly and saying there's a good looking uh, girl out there. Um, good to see Copa in the chat. You just missed that scene, buddy. And um, uh, basically um, uh, lots of stuff happens at the party. The main thing that's really interesting that I thought that came out is that Derek, when he confronts Cameron, <clears throat> yeah, Cameron's, previously spun this yarn about how oh he's been in prison for doing stuff for the Aryan Brotherhood and all the rest of it he basically went down for a two-month sentence and he his sentence got lightened because he grasped on someone else and got then them sent down for longer so he's barely done any time it was kind of soft prison yeah didn't really go for anything and the guy is basically a manipulative coward Derek calls him out on his bullshit it comes to blows, and I, I love the bit where uh, Derek realizes, oh, you know what, fuck it, and he smacks him in the mouth, and then he knows he's he's gone past the point of no return, so he gives him a good kick as well. Brilliant yeah. scene. Um, and he, he he's talking, Cameron's trying to get him to, to, he tries to kind of entice him with, you're going to get promoted, you're going to coordinate the gangs, all of this, and he, he's just not having it. Um, so... Um, you know, it's a really, really good scene. He tries to um, leave, uh, not getting noticed. Um, he's already asked um, Faz, Stacy's character, to come with him. Um, then she realizes he's kind of turned, so she starts calling him a, a lover of a certain word that I won't repeat. Thank you. Um, everybody turns against him, and um, Seth actually ends up threatening him him with a gun at which point Stacy's like kill him Seth shoot kill him you know and you can see that she's just totally crazy this is not a girlfriend you want under any circumstances um and then while, while Seth is distracted he grabs the gun takes it from him uh and he gets out he points it at people and it, it's kind of funny because he's surrounded by like 40 50 guys and they could have easily overpowered him if any of them had the guts most of them are just there to drink, party, get drunk, you know, m maybe talk some bullshit. But they're not really, you know, they're not really these committed terrorists. They're just idiots. And if they were these committed terrorists, you know, five, six of them wouldn't have thought twice about try trying to jump him. But they they're cowards at the end of the day. Um, so no one tries that. And he leaves. He disposes of the gun. And uh, uh, Danny, who's already left the party um uh runs into him they kind of have a bit of a fight 
and then they go home and he says what happened to you man and then we're going to go flash back into our prison narrative now before we go down that road uh anybody got anything they want to say about this keep it short because we're 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 going over a bit longer than i intended so uh no, no. keep the uh, great scene uh, not going to say anything more <coughs> <other> than that <laughs> well i just like how you know this feels like the climax of the movie but it's it, like, it did it pretty did early yeah. on and then you realize like oh the big yeah the, yeah yeah the climax is later you know <laughs> in the past yeah now yeah. i mean um, in a, it could have been just the two brothers walking off into the sunset. Uh, why don't I tell you about what happened in prison? Cut to credits. Yeah. Oh my god! Uh, this, this scene right here, I find disturbing. And mm. in real life, I mean, I think Vex said it earlier. Hate is not inherited; it's taught. Exactly. And the fact that people in real life, as well as in this movie, actually teach their children this garbage is scary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's what all that's how most gangs uh, operate. You know, they gotta get them when they're young. You know, and cults, exactly. same thing. Yeah. The only thing I would say, Lance, for me, the the condensed version is this entire yeah, thing is that what Derek learns pretty fast, and not just any gang, they will turn on you very fast. It's like you are only as uh, important as long as you're useful to them, and that's what Derek learns being down, and he learns from Stacy Stacy Keach's character, and it's, it's just it's like all YouTube. Kinds of, yeah, pretty much. I'm just kidding. I'm just yeah. Kidding. No, but like these people, yeah, they're, they're not your family. They're, they're not your friends. And his girlfriend very fast finds out that, wow, it's like now once you're not part of the cause anymore, they will just in a heartbeat stab you in the back. Yeah. Well, uh, that's that's absolutely true. And I mean, that kind of happens again later. Uh, we're going to find yeah. out shortly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So all very telling. Love the, love the stuff with Cameron. Okay. So we move into prison and we're, we're 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 now flashing back to the prison narrative and this is really it's the story that Derek tells Danny and he tells him the whole story in one go because at this point he hasn't talked to him about what happened in prison and we we get a compilation of scenes over the three years that he spends in there he goes into intake um and straight away, uh, and it kind of turns to to Derek narrating this uh, part of the scene, and and he, he decides, you know, he's going to show his colours fairly on. He walks into the exercise yard, takes his vest off so everyone can see his swastika. You've got your usual gangs. There's the Hispanics, African Americans, and then we've got the Aryan Brotherhood over on one side. So he looks to them for comradeship, but he, he realises that the beliefs that he's been instilled about, you know, look down on other races, they're inferior and all the rest of it doesn't really cut in prison life where gangs have to work together in order to survive. They sell drugs to each other. They do things underhand. Everybody does a bit of dealing. He disapproves of this and uh, he's kind of expecting things to carry on as they were. He sort of wants to carry on, you know, doing r racist missions and having pops at other gangs. Whereas, Actually, everybody kind of wants to keep things relatively peaceful to the degree that they can. The um, the gang is inside is run by an absolutely huge actor. This guy is six foot eight tall. Um, and uh, this is the same actor who takes the lead in the shower scene, which we'll come on to in a second. Now, mm. I bet you guys don't know this. That actor died before the film was released. Wow. Did not, did not yeah. know that. <clears throat> he had a heart attack. He died before the film came out. Um, wow. And uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you his name. So I wrote it down. Nicholas R. Olson. Uh, yeah, he had, a, he had a heart attack before. And I guess, you know, six foot eight, huge guy. That does happen with really big guys sometimes. Yeah. The heart's not strong enough to... Um, you got you got a high chance of of that happening and so on. But um, yeah, so uh, I'll try and get a couple of relevant pictures up quickly. But yeah, so we 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 in in one of the jobs he gets assigned is doing the laundry, where he meets the character of Lamont, uh, played by a guy. Joy, sorry. sorry, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, brilliant performance. Now, how he got cast in the film? There's a great interview with him on Facebook. Um, they actually, the producer and the director went to see a stand-up set and he was the warm-up guy 
and they preferred him to the actor that they went to see. Now, um, nearly all the scenes with him and Norton, apart from when they meet initially, were improvised. <clears throat> Tony uh, Kay, the director, actually wanted them to have this really natural affinity. And he found out that uh, he was a big Lakers fan. So that whole, and Norton was a Celtics fan. So he said, right, I want you to have an argument about who's better, Laker or Celtics, and we're going to film it. So that was just improvised because um, he wanted that friendship, that growth of that friendship to be really organic mm. um, in, in the movie. And uh, it's, it's great. I'm going to skip through this a little bit more rapidly. Um, so various things unfold in, in, in prison. Um, Derek doesn't approve of the, uh, the drug dealing. Um, Lamont, played by Guy Torrey, tries to start make Derek laugh and he does things like a Ku Klux Klan yeah. impression under a sheet, which was pretty, <laughs> I remember funny. That. That was pretty, pretty funny. funny scene. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and um, L Lamont starts giving him advice on women. There's a great scene, which again, um, Guy Torrey improvised. It was actually part of his stand up set. You know, don't let a woman when she comes to visit you in prison leave angry because you don't get to go home and have that makeup sex afterwards that good makeup sex you know uh so um you don't want to kind of do joe that with Torrey. someone else it's, lance it's, his name is joe tory guy tory is his brother i thought it was guy no you that's sure? joe tory right there guy tory is his older brother uh okay uh let me double check on that but um yeah it says guy tory on imdb in this still i yeah. stand corrected that's all right um, so, um, they may well both be actors, but yeah, Guy, Guy, Torres, Guy Torres, this character. So, um, now on the, on the, on the DVD, you guys will find this interesting. All the scenes are named on the DVD and the shower scene, um, on the DVD is named the truth about white supremacy, which I found quite interesting. Um, uh, and basically Derek starts to separate himself from the Aryan Brotherhood. He decides they're kind of fake. Um, and then he realizes that their ideology, really, everything he's been taught outside is he starts realizing it's kind of bullshit. Um, and really, the, the most real person he meets in the prison is the character of Lamont. They start bonding. They're becoming friends. Yeah. But the brothers, as Lamont tells him, still want to kill him because the Cribs, you know, he killed two gang members. So the gang in prison want to kill him. Um, now the Aryan Brotherhood are no longer protecting him. <coughs> and in fact, in a very graphic scene, um, they hold him down or, or pin him against the wall in the shower and rape him. Mm. And it, 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 it's, it's a horrific scene. Um, and I mean, at this point in the movie, this is what's clever about this film. And, and the, the, the writing in The Shield did this really well. You, 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 you know, you don't want to root for this guy, really. Um, um, but when when that sequence happens, you know, you're horrified. It's awful. And then we cut to him in, in the hospital, in the prison hospital, and he's lying on his stomach and he's crying like a child, basically. I would be too. And then yeah. um, uh, a uh, Avery Brooks's character, Sweeney, is able to come in and visit him. And he also says that he's able to negotiate for an early release. Uh, and that's why it's important that we establish Sweeney has links with the police and so forth. But there's a condition on this. And the condition is he wants him to help get bring bring Danny back into the fold, get Danny away from this. So this sets up everything that we've seen, um, that a lot of which has already happened in the film. It's quite an unusual order, but it, it works. Because this is the moment when this is Danny hearing this story for the first time. And it's his yeah. perspective of the story being told to him. And he realizes what his brother's been through. And it's Danny's epiphany at the end of this story. And it, it, he also has his mother visit him in prison, doesn't want to talk to her. Uh, but she, again, she pleads for the same thing. So, um, yeah, uh, that takes us sort of right through to him talking about the last six months in prison. He was like a ghost. He grew his hair back. He kind of got rid of his tattoos. And um, uh, there's a conversation between Lamont and Derek when he's leaving. And um, 
my take on it is this. He says, I know that you're the only reason I'm getting out of here. And uh, Lamont says, get the fuck out of here. I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, well, I think you've got something to do with it. And Lamont has jokingly said, I run this prison because I control the underwear. Laundry porters. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think he is the top guy in the prison. And I think he's actually, what he says goes, right? He's Kaiser Soze. And I think the reason that he lets this guy goes go is uh, he knows there is more value in putting a changed man back into the community who will in turn influence other people than killing a person that he could have changed. That's my yeah. take on it. Um, that's the whole prison sequence. Now, I have brushed through that somewhat briskly. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Vex, comments? And I'll go to Stepenzo because she's well, uh, on a wee, right. wee break yep. again. Bathroom break. I do like the... Um... Yeah, I muted myself again. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. You go first. <laughs> oh, complex. No, 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 no. Um, sorry. Uh, the shower scene. Um, yeah. For, okay. yeah. Again, without showing you too much, extremely powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was quite disturbed as well that when he is lying on the floor towards the end, you see blood coming out the other end of him as well. There's only yeah. one other film I have seen do that. Um, I want to say it was called Boy A, but it was about like youth in, in the juvenile I, I, system. I know exactly the film. I've seen that movie. Another one yeah, great me. film as well. Um, yeah. But I, you know that, I don't know, the way the, the rest of the film kind of flows out, um, you can tell that it's not a happy ending. Uh, I don't know how he does it, but there's a very masterful way in which there's still so much tension even in like the simple scene when they go to the diner and get their, their coffees and everything. Um, maybe it's the music that does it. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, the, the conversation he has though with um, what was the, the, the guy that he made friends with the laundry Lamont. guy, what was his name? Uh, Lamar. Lamont. Lamont, Lamont, yeah. Lamont the character. I, I quite liked their goodbye to each other. It wasn't that like we're ride or die or anything. It's just like we've acknowledged that we are in each other's lives for a specific purpose and we'll just leave it at that. There doesn't have to be any more than that. So yeah, that's yeah. that's that's all I have to say. Yeah. Uh yeah, okay, cool. Uh it depends though. Anything to add? Yeah, I mean, really great um, you know, uh raw depiction of prison life, you know. Uh I love like how the prison guards are just like yelling and cursing at everybody, you know? And um, yeah, just like this whole, the whole point about Danny Vineyard, uh, uh, sorry, Derek Vineyard is like, he's very uh, militant and he doesn't like um, seeing, you know, his, uh, he, he shows up and puts up his, you know, takes his shirt off and immediately like these Aryan dudes, like, mm -hmm. you know, they see, okay, well, this guy's one of us. So, you know, they bring him in the fold. And then a few short, you know, short uh, year later, he's uh, he's like criticizing them because they're selling drugs with Mexicans and he doesn't he doesn't like that. But they're trying to explain, you know, it's prison. And they even tell him, you know, hey, man, we don't, we're tired of the preaching, the constant preaching. It's kind of becoming a drag. And that's what he's saying. Like, no, I'll talk. No follow through. You guys aren't real racist. You're, you're phony racist. And then, of course, um, yeah, I think it just really escalates when he, um, you know, uh, decides to do. To, to, to go uh, solo, which is like something you shouldn't do in prison. Yeah. That's the thing about prison. Like, you you know, you, you don't even want to be in a gang. You just kind of have to go into a gang to just, you know, get safe. But that is a great moment, though, is like the last uh, few months where he's certain he's going to be killed by somebody and it just never happens. And no, it like, never happens, which is unbelievable. Almost. Yeah. Um, uh, Gaza mentioned Scum. That is oh, a truly man. brutal film. Yeah. And uh, we are going to talk about that. That's coming up on the Best of British awesome. later this year sometime. And I'm going to get a load of my American friends to watch it for the first time, especially for the stream, because most of them have not seen it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Leroy, anything to add quickly about this, uh, the whole prison yeah. narrative? You're not going to believe this, but that... I am going to believe it because it's you. <laughs> that rape scene, that's, that's the first time I've actually witnessed a prison rape scene on film ever yeah oh you've not seen, not seen american me uh before this so i'm guessing no i've not seen america i saw in fact i saw american me for the first time after i saw this movie right and 
And then and then after that, I saw Oz on HBO. Oh gosh, yeah. There's more yeah. than one. In, there's more than one in Oz. There's like five or six, I think. Yeah. So yeah, it's these scenes alone why I never, ever, ever, ever want to end up in prison. I'd rather, I'd rather have the cops just shoot me dead than to ever spend one day in prison. Well, yeah, the way it's, you... it's not Shawshank where it's tastefully, you know, Morgan Freeman narrating uh, and the camera <laughs> pans away. No, it's not. They show it all, and it's like, oh my god, no. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah it's um. But um, in a, like yeah. after I, I really started to feel sorry for him after that scene. I mean, yeah. like, like Vex said, you really. I don't know if she was the one who said it, but it's really hard to feel sorry for this guy at all because he's so evil. Mm. But after that scene right there, and after after Avery Brooks came to visit him in prison, because like, I'd be crying too. I'd be wanting to commit suicide after that. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm surprised he even told his brother what happened to him, because that's something, yeah. if that was me, well, I'd keep that to myself. Brother out of prison. Yeah, you know? yeah I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, horrific thing to happen to anybody, right. male or female. Also, Absolutely. the fact that he hits his own friends that do it to him, you know, or his, yeah. his previous people buddies. Mm -hmm. yeah. People he trusted, people who were supposed to be his people. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of people don't understand this, but I, I've heard this. Most most white guys who join the Aryan Nation in prison, the Aryan Nation kill their kill, the, kill more of their own than other other gang members do. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all, because they want to, I guess, keep the what is it, the clan or whatever clean kind of right it's like eliminate the uselessness which mm -hmm. is like a pretty core thing to their their own ideology so i can believe that yeah. Mm. um yeah this is the scene with avery brooks where he's comforting blue anything yeah. to add quickly um yeah just as, to... uh, like i said before you know derek sees very quickly um to enzo like he said he's being preachy and talking about life on the outside the thing is <laughs> dude you're not on the outside anymore inside there there has to be a certain amount of synergy it you know, prison rules are different than outside rules you may have that you know white versus blacks versus mexican outside in here we're kind of all together you have no choice and like leroy said and i said earlier he finds out very quickly how quick your own people will turn on you the second you're not useful to them. And it's a hard lesson he has to learn. And in some ways, it is a good redemption arc because, yeah, you are seeing this character like, man, I really fucked up my life. And, um, okay, things have to change for me. And as somebody who's, who's done prison myself, when he gets out, remember, when you're in prison, it's Groundhog Day. One year, two years, ten years, nothing changes for you. When you get out, life goes on whether you're there or not. But you're amazed when I got home after three years how many people were exactly the same as when I left. I, I changed, but a lot of my friends and family didn't. I'm like, dude, it's been three years. You're still at the same dead-end job, the same house. You're, you're the exact same person that mm. three years ago I, I, I said goodbye to. But, like, you know, I lost 85 pounds, and I'm like, wow, what, what happened to you? And, <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let, let's move on to the last sort of section of the film, and I'll, I'll get through this relatively quickly because uh, I want to try and get done by midnight. So this is where the film, for me, man, I mean, God, you know, the film kept pulling out surprises. You know, you, you kind of thought you knew where it was going, you knew something, and then, so, yeah, it was amazing that he didn't get killed in the prison. Um, and, um, but like I said, you know, I think Lamont's character almost kind of viewed him as a weapon uh, to release back... Uh, you know, this guy, he could see that this guy has was on an arc of redemption and he was going to help him because, you know, one less racist is one less racist. So um, we get, um, uh, we go into uh, the release. He's been released. He's told uh, Derek, uh, Derek's told Danny the whole story. And he's like, I'm sorry, Derek. And then we kind of go into this sort of soft montage where they take down all the Nazi paraphernalia is explaining he's going to take the family away. This is intercut with some scenes with the Cribs gang looking for Derek driving past uh, the uh, apartment block. We know that they know where he lives, and it's kind of set up that they're looking for Derek. They're going to kill Derek if they can. Uh, revenge, probably, for the murders he committed that when he went into prison. Um, uh, so we're expecting something to go down. Um, but you know, we don't quite, we don't quite know what, what, what's happening. We realize, um, at this point as well, that, uh, the voice of 
the paper is furlong it's it's his paper it's the voice of the paper he's doing for sweeney and there's this great scene where he says well you you'd think that this racism started with the death of my father, but actually it started before that. And we go back to a far more innocent time with the family sitting down again, once again for dinner. Uh, I really like the actor that plays the dad. I, I've seen him in lots of very kind of, you know, dad roles and stuff like that, where he's playing, you know, ordinary characters on TJ Hooker. And I bet he was, I bet he was kind of juiced to play this character because it was quite a different, character for him uh somebody could check the name of the actor for me that'd be great i don't have it to hand i think he passed away recently but um he's really good and he talks about how at his firehouse uh, you know this affirmative action thing has forced him to take on uh two black firemen that may not have got the job otherwise and and maybe they're being uh, he's being forced to take them on over to firemen that would have been better for the job now this is interesting to me because there's a whole conversation going on about this in my industry right now um because we've had in the last five years we've had a massive push for diversity and rightly so uh because for a long time the industry has been very white um but now uh, it's got to the point where and i can cite examples and i don't want to go too off topic here but I have sent scripts to people to read where I've put a female African name on the script and I've put my own name on the script and the first one's got a reply and the second one hasn't. So, um, uh, you know, and I've worked a really long time in the industry to become the writer with the ability that I am, but because I'm white and 50, I'm starting to feel like that doesn't count for anything. And I, it's really interesting that I'm in an industry that's starting to make me feel like that uh, and that I'm unwanted and useless. And I've had this conversation with a black female producer friend of mine who I'm actually going for lunch with tomorrow. Uh, and I could tell you loads more about that, but I don't want to get off track. But the thing that's so brilliant about this film and the reason I mentioned that is that the conversation they're having at that dinner table is so relevant today. It, it, it really is relevant um, because some of the things that happen, I think, are going to drive people towards racism and racist attitudes. Um, mm. Not me, but other people, I think, will go down that road. They already uh, are in this country. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, it's it's there's a conversation to be had about that topic. Um, and uh, again, it's all about having conversations. Um Random, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate you, and and always good to have different opinions in the chat. It's all good. You and Adam Gray will go out on a date and make up pretty soon, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, right. So we 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 have that dinner scene with the dad. Very well done. D we're now back in the present. Derek is dressed up to go and see his parole officer, and he hears that Seth and Cameron have been jumped and they've been beaten up. There's a bit here that's a bit unclear because the teacher is now asking Derek to help him um, help, help a police officer solve this crime. I don't know why that is. Why would Derek know who are the people that have beaten up these people? That, that was a bit of a weird plot point that made no sense to me whatsoever. I think it's just just serves as a, as, as a distraction for the fact that Danny's about to take a hit. Well, Danny I goes to school. I think he's actually asking him to um, get get embedded back into it and help like bring down the thing, and that's where he says like I can't, it's too late. Like I already told him no, I'm told him I'm out. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's not, but it's not very, it's not very well explained in the scene. I, I watched it a couple of times. The I other think, thing is, there's, I mean, we talk about deleted scenes, but yeah, um, it's not clear if he got jumped. Does that mean what what Derek did to them? But it's actually in a deleted scene. We see no, there was an actual other event. Yeah, so. There's a great deleted scene with Seth and Cameron after the party, debolical, where they go for a chicken burger. Seth is eating mountains of food and Cameron is now psyching him up to be the next leader. He's completely inappropriate. He's not leading material. What he's actually doing is he's planting the seeds to get Cameron to kill Derek because he knows Derek is a loose end and Derek can finger him for crimes. So he's actually setting 
that scene is actually quite important and it's annoying yeah. that it got cut, but it is on the DVD um, and it's worth looking at. Um, so that it's another scene that I think should be in the movie. Um, so basically then what happens is Danny goes into the, the school to serve his paper and he's in the bathroom taking a waz with the paper on the side of the urinal um, when uh, the black kid that we saw right at the beginning that had the confrontation in walks in with a gun and kills him. And that scene happens so quick and yeah. so fast. My God, in the, in, in the cinema, it took me completely by surprise. I was, I was gobsmacked. People screamed out. So uh, one person screamed out no, like really loudly. Um, everybody was in shock. Because at this point, you like Danny because you know he's a good kid. Mm -hmm. um, you know he's <coughs> redeemed himself. There's an interesting thing here as well, which I want to show people. This is the moment where Danny gets shot, doesn't hold any punches. This is the expression on the face of the kid that, that's killed him. I think the kid is also in shock. <coughs> he didn't expect his face to get covered in blood. He's never killed someone before. Um and uh, you know what? What's really sad, um, uh, and and th I say this often, is at this moment. It's the cycle of violence. It's Shakespeare. This is a very old story trope that that in this film it, it's so effective. This kid is fucked for life. His mm -hmm. life is finished. This 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 kid's this kid is done. Yeah. So there are two lives. Two lives destroyed here. Totally, totally, absolutely heartbreaking. And then we go into a voiceover and um, Edward Furlong says, my conclusion at the end of his paper is hate is baggage. Life is too short to be pissed off all the time. I hope people in the chat are taking notes. Mm -hmm. um, and then You're not quotes, my dad, Lance. <laughs> then, he, then he quotes, I just want everybody to get along, man. I'm kidding. Uh, Love he, just, he, he then uh, says, um, we are not friends. Uh, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bands of affection. The mystic Abraham chords of memory will swell when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. It's not exactly a Lincoln quote. It's a bit of, bit of a mix. Um, and um, we cut to these <clears throat> scenes of the ocean and 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 Venice. In these kind of warm light, and um, yeah, Derek Derek comes to the to the scene, runs in, and he, he's cradling that Danny in his arms, and and you know, I, I think ultimately it's awful that this happens, but it kind of has to happen because otherwise there isn't an ultimate pen penance for Derek for the murders he committed. And and his brother dies because of the murders he committed, so um, that's why he's targeted, um, mm. and it, and the whole thing kind of comes full circle. Now there are there are very few films when the film finishes. I'm sitting there and I'm like, Christ, yeah, you know, not, wow, not that really was, a popcorn that was, movie. That, that was something, but it just and it. We were, we went down the pub. We were talking about it for hours afterwards. Um, I, extremely well done ending. Um, I, I'll just summarise my thoughts quickly. Uh, the race and and um, um, racism and far right supremacy and the, the divide in the American narrative is a very very complicated subject to do correctly and thematically um, in cinema as a story. It's, it's not an easy topic to take on. And um, this film grasps, grasps it by the balls and takes it far further than you ever think it's going to go. I think it's one of the best films that, that dives into the subject of, uh, of race racism far right ideology all of that stuff cults gangs and makes no apologies at any time um and the arc of the characters is absolutely fascinating if you were going to do a sequel to
to this movie, and I, I'm not suggesting for one minute that there should be one, or you were going to remake this film, I would say, right, now tell us the story of the black kid after what happens to him when he goes to prison. What's his character arc after that? You yeah. know, because he's not going to get out for a long time. So by the time he gets out, is he still full of hate or does he find redemption? How does he find redemption? Yeah. You know, and, and you know that there's a story there to be told. And and what's Ed Norton's character's future now? Um, is he going to become hateful again? You don't know. Um, you know, all of that's kind of left open to interpretation of the audience. And I think that's brilliant as well. Uh, Adam Gray's right. It, it, it wasn't a good date movie for him. That Him and that girl <laughs> didn't last very long. Um, sorry about that, man. Uh, don't do uh, Irreversible for a date movie either. I can. Oh, yeah. Uh, First hand experience tell you that's not a good idea. <laughs> oh boy. Thank God the Let's girl do irreversible next week. The girl oh, I, I like that movie. <laughs> we are good. We're gonna do that film at some point. Um uh, yes for now. Yeah. So yeah, uh, let me go through my guests. Uh, thoughts on the ending and then give me your final thoughts on the movie. Uh Vex and people in the chat, rate the film out of ten if you've seen it. My rating for this is nine out of ten. Um, uh, so that I'll go with the ending and then I'll give my, my rating. Yeah, um, uh, 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 okay. That's, don't take this the wrong way. Perfect ending. Um, simply no. because it doesn't, it doesn't play it, uh, safe in which, oh, it, it has to be a happy film because he goes through this redemption arc and whatnot. And he, he tries to save his brother, but that's not what happens in reality. Right. Like the cycle of hate is something that is just continued. And you even see that in um, like the dinner scene where the father is still alive and yeah. and Danny's just like, maybe it started a lot earlier than, you know, Cameron and dad die and all of that stuff. Um, so it's unfortunate, but it's like a it's a soul for a soul almost for what Derek did all those years before. Right. Um, the look on the kid's face, too. It's like it's again, it mirrors Derek's face when he's getting arrested. It's like, oh, sh oh yeah. shit, that's what happens. Did that yeah. happen? Oh no! Like it, it's you can see him go from satisfaction to just pure fear at what he's done, kind of deal. Um, not a fan of Edward Norton's acting in that final scene. I don't think he pulled it off very well in terms of getting the emotion needed. It felt overplayed. It felt theatrical. Uh, that's that's my biggest critique of that. Um, but I give this an eight point five out of ten. Um, like we had mentioned earlier, it's really just that that little bit with the teacher and the 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 was it the the gang squad that just mm. felt a little bit forced in to try and tie some some stuff together or introduce some some specific uh, plot points. Uh, you could do without it, and the film would it would be fine. It's not really a point that's needed. Um, Beautifully shot. I like the way the use of light throughout this film. It really yeah. reflects kind of Derek's transformation throughout everything. Same with the color you mentioned earlier, black yeah. and white view of the world. Now he sees the whole uh, view of the world, right? Um, the way it transitions between current day and, and the memories as well. There's very few films that can pull it off as seamlessly as this one does. It mm. doesn't feel choppy. It, it just flows beautifully and you but you still feel that kind of logical momentum building up as the film goes to um yeah uh it, it's a it's a seriously it's a it's a phenomenal film and it's it's a must-see film i think uh not just for the performances but really because it does discuss a subject matter that is taboo but it does it in a way that touches on so much more than just white supremacy and racism so much more yeah, well said, well said. Uh, Stupenzo. Well, a few things about the ending. And I like what um, you did with your rating. Nine out of ten. Yeah. Very good. Spoilers. <laughs> Nine. Nine. I just think of Rammstein every time I say that. Yeah, um, yeah I love um, – well, first of all, there's a good point here. Um, after they take down the uh, flags and stuff, there's like this hopefulness, and they see the one flashback that's in color. And it's when their little baby is on the beach. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like their eyes, yeah. Their, their eyes are unclouded by the racism then. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah, um, I think that another big problem about the uh, ending with the um, visceral killing, super bloody. Uh, um, uh, I think it's just, it, it comes out of nowhere. It seems like a um, an unwarranted response. I thought he was going to get jumped maybe. 
or uh, yeah, get his get his beat up a little. Like the fact that the kid just brings a gun and just shoots him dead, it's like you're killing, you're ruining both of your lives, you know. So it just seems very um, uh, unwarranted, and that's why it's probably so shocking because it's like mindless violence. Uh, it's 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 just it goes out of nowhere. Um, the other thing, and like uh, like Vic said, this is a perfect ending because it's not a happy ending. It's far from it because not only is his brother dead, but also he's got his white supremacist friends after him. They'll probably get him. Uh, and then also his mother's got lung cancer, so she'll probably be dead soon. I mean, it's just it's it's a whole nightmare. It's only going to get worse. Uh, and they're in poverty. And, uh, they live in extreme poverty right? now. They're not right? getting out of that apartment. Um, and then the other thing is that's really sad. And I'm glad this uh, isn't in the movie. And I heard about this. There's no I didn't see this, but uh, allegedly uh, the uh, original ending uh, was to be a cut of uh, back to Edward Norton shaving his head uh, in the mirror. Oh, like, oh thank Norton. goodness. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it kind of defeats there. the whole purpose yeah. of the movie. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Leave yeah. it. Leave it vague, because you can assume, you could think maybe he goes back to it. Who knows? But I, I, the thing is, he would. They wouldn't let him if he tried to go back to the gag. You know. Yeah. True. Um, so it's it's just a big um it's a big uh, cluster bomb of uh of tragedy. Um and yeah, like Edward Norton says, like it's a great. I've said that before. Like if you can't, you know, you always finish it off with a quote. And if you can't come up with something good, you know, someone else probably already said it better. Just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. quote them. So, and it's uh, just a great, uh, solid movie. Solid <coughs> ending. Nine out of ten. Just to correct myself earlier, uh, William Ross, who plays the father, uh, mm. who was in Boy Meets World, if people remember that Ooh. TV show. Yeah, he is still alive. Um, so I might try and get it. him on the channel at some point. So right. Come on. Uh, I think yeah. he's a really. I think he's a massively, massively underrated actor. Um, yeah, he's only one scene too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah the other right. thing I wanted to say about the father, there's supposed to be a lot of f bombs and cursing. He's supposed to be way more like, ah, you know, f this and that. And then uh, this actor was like, if he just says the one word, the n word yeah. once, that's yeah. all you need to have yeah. it established that he enough. is, yeah. you know planting those seeds you know yeah he says it at the end doesn't he, he says it's yeah, yeah. bullshit yeah, yeah 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 very well done very well done uh leroy i'm gonna I'm go give my rating first i'd give it eight out of ten um even though i haven't seen this movie in 20 years basically um the reason why is because the ending the ending kind of ruined the entire movie for me what <laughs> Um, Why did, why if, did the ending if, what, if you want I, them to leave and go off in the sunset together? Well, huh? that well, that's the kind of movies I like. If I want to see a tragedy <laughs> or a movie with a sad ending, I'll I'll go read William Shakespeare. Okay. Um, but I did make the comment earlier. This is Shakespeare. And, yeah. And the movie, the whole thing was good. Like, if they just ended with him and his brother taking all the Nazi stuff, burning it, and then trying to turn their lives around going off in the sunset that would have been fine but his brother getting killed that just killed him that just killed everything that's me. what makes the film so powerful leroy i mean it's well not, look i think a big thing about tragedy real. is you gotta wait, have wait, wait, guys we got enough tragedies and reality yeah. in in real world for one like for me as a writer they're just one of the reasons why all my books end with happy endings because I try to give people hope. Oh, you just spoiled it now, I, Leroy. I like, now I know I like how all your books end. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me that. We know how all your books end now. <laughs> well, yeah. but uh, people need to have hope. And this movie, when when Derek told a story to his brother and they start taking all the Nazi stuff, to me, I saw it gave me possibly, it gave me hope in the human race. People can change and like this this this, this country music duo one of them's dead montgomery gentry wrote a song called some people change it gives me it gives hope back in the human race and the ending of this movie just destroyed all that and like like i said if i want to see a tragedy or a sad ending i'll go read william shakespeare or watch a movie based off of william shakespeare's plays okay People need to have their faith rewarded, or pe have some hope rewarded, and yeah, that, that's how, that's how I feel about this film. The nineties had this kind of cynicism, you know. That uh, 
I, I agree is kind of not really necessary these days. And I think that tragedy works better when everything's all sunshine and rainbows at the beginning. And we see like this downward fall or vice versa with a happy ending. Everything's got to be crappy at the beginning. I think it works better that way. But I mean, this is a tragic, cynical movie, um, yeah. but there is that glimmer of hope, you know, so I, it's not too bad. I, I think I think the ending is is very powerful. It's one of the most powerful endings in a movie I've ever seen. This is why this would be in my top 30 movies of all time, almost certainly. But anyway, but yeah, good to have differences of opinion. Blue, uh, who, by the way, uh, just for anyone who's wor- uh, wondering, uh, he's not uh, about to join... Uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, he's he does have leukemia. He shaved yeah. his head for charity. Yeah. Charity. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you uh, if you uh, want to kick in some super chat money for a uh, uh, blues haircut, uh, do that now. I'm wasting away. Uh, it, it goes towards the uh, Lance two thousand pound gas and electric bill charity fund. Uh, yeah. So yeah, but Blue, uh, give us. Your thoughts um, on the ending and your thoughts on the film overall. Yeah, I would say uh, to kind of counter Leroy's point that I felt the ending was powerful because it's a simple quote, but Gandhi did say that an eye for an eye makes the whole world go blind. Because yes, um, it, I think it just recycles the endless violence and that's something that the film doesn't have any clear winners or losers, any clear good guys or bad guys. That's what makes it complex and also, as Lance would say, if this was made nowadays, I feel like it would be very, very one-sided. And that's what yeah. makes the film so complex is it's not one sided. It's racism is it's it's a, it's a very complicated issue. And everybody here knows that it's not inherent to human beings. We're not born with this. It's taught to us. I was very lucky to have a very diverse family, mother and father, stepfather, half sisters, et cetera, et cetera, that taught me these things. But these things are taught to our children. And this is what the movie showcases. And I did like the ending because of that, because if the ending didn't happen, it wouldn't hit hard. The, the, the message like this is a good message the good message of the shit at some point should stop but it keeps happening over and over again at mm. the end of the day like lance said because of uh, the eric's uh, the actions of derek now two more kids just lost their lives edward furlong's character but also the kid that shot him the, the kid's doing life in prison simple as that so that's that's two more lives just wasted at some point when does the fucking violence stop when does the hatred end it's got to stop and that's why the ending to me is so impactful for because People need to learn that lesson. Stop. Just, just at some point, stop arguing over, you know, melatonin in our skin, skin tones. If people got, people should evolve. It's, it's 1998 and 2024, and we're still bitching about who has more complexity with the, with their skin. Like, come on, yeah. grow up. Melatonin um, makes you feel relaxed. Uh, uh, melanin. James is Willard, um, I'm not powering yeah, I mean, a cannabis melatonin. farm. These lights are for my Thunderbirds vehicles. Uh, they're, they're, they're warming up the engines. Uh, Melvin has to buy it. Well, we're going to wrap it up pretty soon. Um, thank you. Thank you, Blue, for that. No problem. Yeah, I, I, I really can't praise this film enough. If you haven't seen it, you absolutely should watch it. Uh, just going to mention quickly a couple of other things. So uh, before this stream started, I actually spoke to tony k the director of the movie people will know if they know the background uh that um this was kind of his first hollywood film and he had a very particular idea of the kind of film he wanted to make and initially his first cut of the film was only 95 minutes and it was a very fast-paced kind of guy Ritchie, sort of you know that had that frenetic um energy uh, what we ended up with was a kind of more slow-paced kind of thoughtful film now when he went back in to re-edit, um, uh, because they they told him what they wanted, and 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 he was bunning heads with Ed Norton quite a lot, and uh, Ed Norton would also try and direct the other actors on set, which is a massive no-no. You don't do that on anyone's set, but so obviously they clashed uh, quite a bit, and um, uh, Tony K left the industry uh, for a while. Uh, he did he did an interview with the Guardian. Um, it's, uh, I've put the link in, uh, in the chat earlier. Um, it's worth reading it. It's called losing it and, and it's well named. Um, but, uh, uh, he did actually say he might've popped on tonight and I did warn my guests that that might happen. Um, but it is a difficult time in his life to go back to. So I, I did say, I thought it was unlikely he would come on. 
Uh, however, that offer uh, extends to him permanently. And if you would like to come and discuss the film with us uh, at any time, we'd love to have you on, Tony. So um, do come back uh, another time. And if you did watch the stream, uh, I'd love to know what you thought of our thoughts on the movie. Regardless of how it turned out and how far um, you think uh, it ended up being from your vision, there are very most directors in the industry only ever end up directing one or two movies, uh, and that includes myself. And if I get to direct another one, I'll be very lucky. Um, and um, I mean, I've done 14 plays, but no one in the industry, film industry cares about those. So uh, what I want to say to you, Tony, is this, is uh, regardless of uh, who's responsible for what bit of the film, your name on it as the director is still there. And uh, you should be extremely proud of this film. It started a million conversations in a million houses. And the best impact any filmmaker can hope to achieve with a film about topics like this is to start a conversation between people who go and see it. Uh, I think you should be extremely proud of it. And it's a film that will stand the test of time. And I think it's more relevant now than it's ever been. Um, and that's my final thoughts on it now we're going to be back on we're going to be back tomorrow talking about masters of the air at nine o'clock i've got blue collar loser coming on that. i have the critical drinker i have history bro and i've got a couple of extra guests uh coming on including i think stepenzo's coming on um uh, towards the end we're going to have some extra people towards the end to hear people's thoughts about the show overall i'm about to watch the entire show again from start to finish um after this stream so um <laughs> i can see it all in one go that's my uh, evening's entertainment sorted um but i've got a lot to say about the last episode of masters of the air we've got a couple of other things coming up on um wednesday of next week i am going to be interviewing ben cullis ben cullis is a former um editor and um, novelist, uh, mainly to do with uh, graphic novels and comics. He has worked in the comic book industry for 30 years plus. Uh, he is the sort of driving force behind The 77, which is a new publication house that publishes independent comics, uh, one of which is This Comic is Haunted. They're also doing another comic called Blazer. Um, so he's going to be coming on talking about a lot of their stuff. That's Dave Healy, who's the editor of Comic is Haunted. And he's also going to be introducing me to a couple of very big names uh, in the uh, comic world, uh, one of whom's already to promise to come on to the channel. I don't want to say yeah. who, but it's a massive name. So um, I'll wait until they've uh, given me a date. But So we're interviewing Ben on Wednesday at uh, eight o'clock um so don't forget to pop on that um going to be on tuesday night with the nelson ratings as per normal talking about all things um so the review of shogun uh this week will happen later it will still be on wednesday but it will be a bit later uh it will be starting probably about 11 or 11 30 i'll get Looking back to, to it about that yeah but it will be later um, if you're not watching Shogun, fantastic show. Have you seen it, Bex? Have you seen Shogun? Uh, no, I'm just I'm waiting for it all to come out. I've been watching Constellation, and now Invincible is back on Amazon. So I'm just kind of oh. focusing on those two. And then I can't watch so many shows at once. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I started yeah. watching Constellation on your recommendation. And I thought, right, when I'm done with Masters of the Air, I'm going to come back and binge it. But I I saw the first episode and I quite liked it. Yeah. Oh, it gets, gets even better. Gets yeah. even better. From there. Yeah, yeah, quite liked it. Quite liked it. Great. So um, very quickly, uh, minimum time. So because uh, I want to wrap up. Vex, quick plug for anything. <laughs> uh, Monday, MMM. We are reviewing the 2004 Pixar classic, The Incredibles. Oh, yeah. Uh, over on Cannoli Sasquatch's channel. Lance, are you coming on for that one? I, I probably will. Yeah, I might not be on for the whole thing, but I'll put okay. it yeah, yeah, you can find me there. And then Beast Up on the Little Platoons channel is also happening Monday around 6 p.m. Eastern. 
Uh, Tuesday, I'm over on the Gucci's channel. We are doing an episode by episode review of Scavenger's Reign, one of my top three shows ever. And then wow. Thursday, I'm over back on the Movie Cynics channel for the Blue Room at 7 p.m. Eastern. I put all the details both on my Twitter and my YouTube page, which are both Vex Electronica. It's uh, it's it's we're so busy, you and I, Vex. It's so good that we're being paid big bucks by the hour for all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, right? <laughs> uh, if only that were true. Uh, Stepenzo, anything you want to plug quickly? Uh, yeah, I'm on a few of those uh, streams. Uh, Vex and uh, Lance, you mentioned them too. I've been on a bunch of streams, whoring myself out as usual. Um, Kazam. We released that on Wednesday. Uh, me and my cousin made fun of that movie a bunch. It was very funny. Check it out. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess on Monday, we'll probably be streaming on my channel after Incredible Stream Late Night, as per usual. And uh, same thing. Uh, I might stream by myself tomorrow for shits and giggles. You know, I don't know. Just subscribe to my channel and see when I'm doing stuff. I don't know. It's it's I'm everywhere these days. Yeah, he is. Uh, maintaining Blue. my grip on sanity. Lou, any uh, YouTube stuff you want to plug quickly? Oh, no. Tomorrow, hang out with you. After this stream, I want to go see the new Michael Keaton film. I think it looks pretty good. Oh, it does look good. Yeah. Oh, so what is it called? Not, you keep not, saying the new Michael Keaton film. Knox. The new Michael Keaton film. It's called Knox. Okay. Not, you know, and Michael Keaton. Like, you know, hey, K you know, X I didn't or, know there was a new yeah. Michael Keaton yeah. film. <laughs> yeah, it's about he's, uh, he, has, he has dementia, but he's a, he's a um, hitman. And yeah. the fight scenes look pretty damn good. It's, it's, uh -oh. it's K-N-O-X, Knox. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Does look. So, does look good. Here's I'll see you tomorrow. Plug. Here's a quick plug for uh, Leroy's books. You can find them all <laughs> Thanks, on Lance. Amazon. They're all about uh, westerns, and as he's already blown it and told us, they all have happy endings. So there, there, <laughs> won't, there won't be any uh, Edward Furlong murder scenes uh, occurring. Uh, but I'm sure the characters this, this, have a treacherous this, route to get there. This um, book is part of a trilogy. If if you right. if you like stories where rapists die horrible deaths. Oh, this trilogy, the Edge of the World trilogy, is for you. Ah, Irreversible, okay. also. That's, That's also I mean, for what you. a great way to sell it. Right. Well, we'll go out there. Uh, listen, I, I appreciate uh, everybody in chat being respectful, which everybody was. There's a little, little, little bit of uh, yeah. cock What's posturing color, earlier yeah. to be expected. But I do appreciate everyone being in a chat uh, and also commenting. Thanks to my guests, uh, Stepenzo, Leroy Blue, uh, American History Vex, great name for an autobiography. Um, I'm going to see everybody again real soon. Uh, don't forget to Good like, Wednesday, and subscribe, Lance. check out all the stuff. I've got books on Amazon as well. I'm going to do a stream about those another time. But if you want to check out any of my sci-fi novels, just Google my name. You'll find all the stuff. It's it's pretty easy uh, to locate. So that's it from us. Uh, we will see you all again real soon. Okay.